Hey everybody, welcome to Talking Landscape Photography number 60. Uh, and tonight we've got a pretty interesting show. Um, we are going to go through the, I guess, the shortlisted finalists of the Australian Geographic Nature Photographer of the Year competition 2021. And then we're also going to um, go through the winners as well and just have a quick look. Now, there's actually quite a lot of entries. Um, and so we're going to have to um, uh, basically um, not spend too much time on each of the images. Um, what we're going to do is go through each category um, of, and there's actually 10 categories, I believe, in the competition. And we're going to go through each category and um, just quickly bring up each image in the category. So there will be a lot of images there. Uh, and then we're going to choose sort of our favorite image uh, from that category and then also then reveal the winners and maybe have a quick chat about the winners as well. So we're going to have to whip through it pretty quick in terms of just because the sheer number of images there. But um, yeah, just thought I'd give a bit of an overview of what's happening. But what I probably should do is um, also introduce our guest, Tom Putt, who's no uh, stranger to the show. Welcome, Tom. Thank you very much for having me, boys, once again. Uh, I, I feel like the, uh, the the fourth wheel in the cog, so to speak. Um, but uh, is that what you say? The first cog in the wheel. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's it's always a pleasure to be on board. And uh, if I can offer some value tonight, um, I'd, I'd be more than happy to do so. My interest in wildlife photography comes from back as a teenager where I used to photograph birds and, and, and um, study birds and catch and band and release them, etc., and uh, my mentor in that um, wildlife uh, volunteer wildlife organisation that I was a part of was a very keen photographer himself and actually was very influential in my career as a photographer in general. And so um, I, I have, I've dabbled in it, you know, time to time. I wouldn't say that I'm a wildlife photographer by any stretch, but I certainly have an appreciation for it and understand the difficulties in capturing some of the images that we see tonight for sure. Awesome. And Nick, um, do you want to um, speak about the actual awards itself? Do you want to describe it to people that might not know about it and sort of pitch it for what it sort of stands for and how where it sits in, in the biggest scheme of, of the global competitions? Yeah, sure. Um, so it's a, it's a, um, it used to be called the Anzang, Anzang competition, Australia, New Zealand. Uh, what does it stand for? Antarctica and New Guinea. Right. Yes, uh, Nature Photographer of the Year Award. Uh, it's now the Australian Geographic Nature Photographer of the Year Award, and it's put on jointly by Australian Geographic and, and hosted by the South Australian M Museum. And uh, basically it's a Australia-wide and uh, the general bioregion, which includes, uh, I think, Indonesia, Antarctica, and New Zealand, and they Australia. They call it the Wallace Line, which is Papua, a... Papua, Papua New Guinea. Yeah, Papua New Guinea, yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. Yep, uh, includes uh, any images from those locations. Uh, it focuses mainly on, on wildlife, um, but there are other categories for landscape and botanical as well, um, which are very hotly contested every year. But basically, um, yeah, each year you, you get to um, submit some images uh, that you obviously have to pay an entry fee for, like most competitions. And then uh, a short list is compiled of images, the judges sit down and go through all the images. I think there are over 2,200 entries, I think, they're yeah. getting up to most the last... I think that, yeah, it's pretty common that's over 2,000 each each competition, mm. yeah. So, so you, like you've actually judged it, haven't you? Yeah, I judged it in 2017. Uh, it was a real honour to do that. And um, I'm assuming that um, this year they probably didn't judge it actually in person, um, which would have been a shame. But um, traditionally, people actually fly into the South Australian, fly, or fly to Adelaide and then go to the South Australian Museum and um, and actually uh, judge it there. And that's what I did with um, Steve Parrish and also Jason Edwards from Nat Geo. So that was a pretty cool um, crew to be judging with, um, Steve yeah. Parrish being one of my idols. Um so, um, yeah, it was a very um, eye-opening experience and, yeah, real honour to do that. Um, and certainly is, it's definitely one of the, probably the premier nature photography competition in Australia. And what um, I guess folks like Nick and I like about it is it, it also promotes very authentic photography in, in the sense of really um, showing nature for what it is uh, and not from what it, what it can be in Photoshop. So, yeah, so um, it's, it's, got, it's got some restrictions in what you can and can't do with your entries. 
Uh, you can do general sort of contrast and colour adjustments and that sort of thing, but no additions or subtractions to the image, no cloning, um, except for dust spots, of course, no, um, um, no warping, um, that sort of thing. Uh, they do allow focus stacking and, and exposure blending, um, which is a, a new addition about uh, maybe three years ago that came in. Um, and of course, yeah, I actually uh, met with Ozgeo um, and actually helped them with the rules at mm. one point as well, just to clear up um, exactly, you know, some of those, some of the rules in the past didn't allow for more modern techniques that, that are really just um, uh, overcoming limitations of the camera equipment. They're not actually telling porky pies, so, so mm. to speak. They're just making the images uh, higher quality. And so that shouldn't be penalized in the rules. And so that's why they, that, those adjustments are made. Yeah, exactly, and, uh, and a, a really good addition to the rules, in my opinion. And uh, and if you're selected, if you're lucky enough to be selected as a, a shortlisted um, entry, and there's usually around about 100 or so, between 90 and 110 images a year. Yeah, it's normally about 10 per category, I believe, is yeah, what they try and aim for. Yeah. And then there's also a, um, a process where they actually review the images to make sure that they're actually legitimate. They actually get the raw files from the contestants or the, the entrance and um, actually compare the raw files against the um, actual entered image just to make sure that there's no funny business going on. Uh, and that's another reason why the competition is so well regarded because the images are all images are essentially vetted um, in that in that space. So um, which is which is pretty cool. Yeah, it is. And the, the entry is usually open late in the the year and close sort of around the end of January into February, if I yep. remember correctly. The shortlisted images are usually the people shortlisted are usually informed by about the end of March. And then um, the actual announcement happens um, around the second week of August uh, each year. So uh, we've just had, obviously, the, the winners announced for this year and, uh, and what a wonderful collection it is. And, we, uh, and it's, it's normally also announced at the SA Museum and so they quite often encourage the entrance to actually fly into Adelaide again and, and attend the opening. And I think you've done that once, Nick. I've done that a couple of times. Tom, I've seen you there too. Yes, yeah, I so, did it um, probably about five years ago, I think it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah that was awesome. And have, have a few drinks after. That was quite nice too. That's right. Um, you were there. That's right. <laughs> I, I think that was the first time I met you. Yeah, you, I think it probably was. Yeah. You'd actually, um, uh, I remember that night because uh, yeah. I was dirty with you because you'd actually done really well in the Epson Pano Awards that year. And I think, oh, Dave, yeah. I think Dave uh, told you that night. Oh, that's right. Yeah, um, yeah, Dave Evans was there, and yeah, no, it was a really great evening. So, um, and it's great. So that's a really lovely part about this competition too. You actually get your images into an exhibition in a museum, and um, I think the last few years, I don't know if it's going to happen this year, but that actually goes to the Australian Museum in Sydney as well. So, All right. and it's quite a quite a really well put together exhibition. Um, it sounds so, like it, it's in similar vein to the um, Natural History Museum one in London. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously not on a grander scale because it's not covering the worldwide geographic, but, uh, you know, it, it's it's getting right up there in terms of it's come a long way since it started many years ago where it was started by a doctor, I believe, who, um, you know, was doing it on the side to recognise, um, you know, wildlife photography here in this in this region. But it sounds like it's going from strength to strength every year, which is fantastic. Mm. Oh, yeah, and it's, it's definitely um, definitely awe-inspiring to go through all of the images that get selected. Unfortunately, um, I wasn't shortlisted this year. Nick missed out too, which, which it surprised me even more. He's been... I'm getting a few in every year since I started. Four in a row, did you do? Hey, four years in a row, not shortlisted. Yeah, yeah, I, I was lucky to be yeah shortlisted four years in a row. I had two years where I had two images in two different categories, and then um, I was lucky enough to be runner-up in two categories over two different years. So that was great. But I missed out this year, and and it's a really really stiff competition, and. Um, uh, yeah, if you don't if you don't yeah. make it in then it has to be that's the way i see it oh, no, no, no. <laughs> so, so nick, nick, are you, uh, nick are you entering into the um landscape category is that right i uh, normally into landscape botanical and well. botanical um right and botanical is the one you traditionally do well in isn't it yeah um, monochrome um and our impact sometimes and i've i have entered um, some of the animal categories a couple of times. Um, I don't have many animal photos that are <laughs> much chop or more a landscaper, but but uh, yeah, botanical and landscape are the main 
main ones that I enter, and I, I suspect there's quite a few of my uh, friends out in the, the world of photography that are, are pretty similar. Um, and, uh, yeah, and, and each year um, uh, different people do really well, and uh, it's no different this year. It's a, just, a, just a superb collection of images and very exciting to see um, some of our friends do particularly well this year. So it's, mm. it's pretty great. I'm not sure... Um... I'm not sure what I missed because I dropped out through a bit. Sorry, folks. But one of the, like, I've never actually never entered. And one of the reasons I haven't is because I find that the, personally, I, I'm drawn towards creating to art, abstract and, and artistic oriented work. And this tends to be a much more scientific based and um, probably a bit more, um, uh, not conservative, but a more traditional sort of photographic mm-hmm. approaches. And, and a lot of the highly watered images are ones that, it, that involve you know, quite a lot of technical difficulty or or specific subject knowledge uh, around the wildlife and botanicals and different structures and and you know I'm same as same as uh, you guys I'm not going to say that I'm a I'm a wildlife or naturalist photographer but that's also the charm and the beauty of this particular contest and that it really awards great camera craft uh, and not post production and it's very clear when people have very high subject knowledge and. As you'll see when we go through the images, you, you'll sort of, and particularly people like Tom's background on, on some of them, you, you'll get more of an understanding of the actual difficulty and, and rarity of some of the photographs and just how hard some of them are to actually capture, mm-hmm. uh, which is easy to overlook. Uh, and that's an issue, I think, as a judge, and probably why they choose some of the judges they do, because if you don't have that technical knowledge, you won't actually understand how hard it was to get yeah. what looks like a really simple shot. Uh, and again, that's part of what I consider a real learning curve uh, when I go through the images, and I do every year. Um, and reading the captions yourself in your own time, you'll actually find you'll learn quite a bit as well. And and they make a point of making sure everybody gets access to all the technical aspects of the camera. Yeah, the access and, information, yeah. So, and, and so in terms of um, how well Tim Rate did um, in the port, uh, portfolio category, does that sort of change your mind a little bit in terms of what? what yeah, you maybe. Like I, I obviously, you know, Ariel's one of my favourite areas, and and funny enough, I actually flew over the same area as a lot of Tim entries just a, just a month or two ago. Um, so I probably could have had a crack. <laughs> But, uh, but again, enough chat for me. I reckon uh, well, I think um, just like people do, like the judges do appreciate the artistry of the imagery, imagery as well, and we'll certainly see that as well as we go through it, the It images. does come through, and yeah. I think if you can do both, even better. Mm. Yeah, so so I think we, we better, given there's, there's so many images to go through, we better get into it. And, yeah. and as, as I mentioned, we'll, we'll sort of just, I'll just bring up um, the image um, images one by one in each category. Uh, and we, we probably probably won't like, have... did, did we mention that criteria wise, it's actually quite strict? And there's very we have little talked about no... um, what the what the process is and, and the reviewing of raw files and, mm. and things like that. So yeah. Yeah. Um, so we've we've covered yeah. that part. Just 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 before we start, though, we've got a very special thing that we have to cover tonight, and that is a very very special person uh, involved with this show is turning a very special birthday uh, tomorrow, <laughs> and uh, so uh, a big happy birthday and congratulations to Luke for reaching your fortieth year. Oh, thanks, <laughs> <Andrew>. <laughs> ah, ah, yeah. oh he it's snuck that good. one in, Nick. <laughs> no, I was always planning it. Um, happy happy birthday for tomorrow, mate! And um, it's an absolute privilege to call you a great friend. And um, and uh, um, Paul and I and uh, a couple of other friends had a great time with you on the weekend. So thanks very much, mate, for being a great friend. Oh no, I really appreciate it, man. Um, yeah, it's nice to nice to still be here kicking along. So <laughs> hopefully for yeah, many we, more we years are, to come. Well, so. I was thinking on the way home yeah. yesterday on the boat that uh, we we. we... <laughs> We might have gotten flipped out. It was pretty gnarly. Oh, yeah. No, it's, it's lovely to be able to get away and certainly very grateful for being able to, to be able time to have for that opportunity. It, We're certainly not taking it for granted. Um, and so, um, yeah, thanks for that, Nick. No worries, man. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so I was just describing, we'll bring up each image very quickly. Um, we won't have time to talk about them. And then what we'll do is we'll select our favourites um, based on what we've seen. Um, and then I can even open up the image and we can have a little bit of a closer look. Um, and then we can go from there. So, and then I can re- also reveal the winners on. at the end so we can sort of see what the, what the judges actually chose. Yeah. I've seen that look on many judging panels, Tom. That's it. That's it. It's my, it's my serious look. It's my, <laughs> I, I'm going I'm to pretend to know what I'm talking about here. All right. So hopefully you can all see that. Um, I've just opened up the, um, 
animal behavior category. Oh, yeah. So we're taking this straight off the South Australian Museum website. So we haven't downloaded these images or anything like that. We're just viewing what's available to the public. Um, so we can go from there. So I'll just bring it, uh, look at, I'll just look through these now. So maybe as, as an audience member, maybe do the same. In, in your own mind, have a quick reflection on which images you're drawn to and why, and then maybe compare notes with us as we, as we go through what we're drawn to. It's probably, it's a good process to go through, I think. There's 12 categories, is that right? I think there's 10. Ten. I'm always, always fascinated to see who took the photos because um, there are people that you can recognise as, um, as being regular sort of entrance slash shortlisted people, people who are recognised in these genres of being, you know, some of the best that we have in this uh, geographic area. So I always enjoy seeing whose names come up each year that I recognise, that's for sure because they just consistently produce good work and hence why they're shortlisted every year almost. And you can sort of see with some of the cameras, like some of them are super high-end pro cameras and some of them are not. So it's not necessarily about the equipment, mm. uh, which I actually appreciate as well. Yeah, it's really good to see um, and, and understand that. And I think it's, all, it's quite an educational experience too, just going through the images and seeing, you know, different equipment that's being used uh, yeah. for, the, for Luke, the images. Luke, just yep. before we uh, go on, can you comment as to what discussions just quickly go on when you come to choose winners in each of the categories? Is it is it a range of different things? Is, is it like, okay, this is technically a difficult image to get or this is a unique image because of the animal that's being photographed? What is discussed by the judges in your um, experience to decide? Well, yeah, I think um, it's probably going to depend on, it would be different every year because the judges are different and, and the yeah. way they interact and do things are very different. And I was sitting next to Steve Parrish and I wasn't terribly keen to disagree with his opinion given his <laughs> longstanding um, experience with wildlife photography you weren't so, intimidated um, by, him by any chance were you sorry you weren't oh, well, intimidated by him by no like, no he wasn't he's actually a lovely lovely man and we really really hope to have him on the show at some point um so yeah certainly no issues from that perspective but um just more intimidated by his um um you know his, his standing in the in the um like how long he's been doing it for yeah um, exactly so he was probably the photographer that inspired me to to um, get into photography um, in the first place. So um, was reading through all of his books when I was very young um, and um, just would think, wow, I'd love to be able to take images like that. So you can't really go up to that sort of person and, and sort of um, disagree with them too much. But I did. There was a few where we had a very healthy conversation about. So it wasn't that like um, it, it was more around the wildlife area. So he looked more at that. And then I was more looking at the landscape. But so I think that, you know, people can understand that there's, there's um, judges with different strengths. And I, I would like to think that the, that's um, sort of accounted for in, in the way that the, the yep. judges feel about themselves. But that's really... Um, going to change every year so what I just described mightn't happen in another year and um, and there's no real um, right or wrong way of doing it as long as you come to a, a unanimous decision at the end um, right okay do, do they have specific criteria for each category um, well there are general rules for the category but that's that's available publicly there's no secret about that um, so they they will just make sure that the images that are selected meet, match the actual general rules and 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 there has there is a pre-screening process before they're judged so there are some like you, you know I think they mentioned there was a, some images from Scotland and places that, that are just not even in the correct area so they do a preliminary screening just to remove um, images that don't that aren't, shouldn't be there. Um, I think one thing that one thing that um, is is a bit like us going through these images now. There's you can't spend a lot of time on every single image. So um, and that's like that in a lot of competitions. And so that's why it's really important that the image is interesting and eye catching and has something to say immediately. Um, it's very hard to. Um, you know, be drawn into an image. Um, well, if you're not drawn into the image, I guess, then it's hard to um, 
for, for the judges to dwell on that and have a chat about it. So um, that's one thing that um, probably the images that get shortlisted are, are the ones that really catch the judge's attention in that in that way. So I've brought the specific rules up for each category so we can talk about it um, as we go. They're not too specific with some and a bit more specific with others. Yeah, I think the, um, I mean, the category titles are generally pretty well self-explanatory anyway, isn't it? But yeah. I, think I always found between animal behaviour and animal portrait and habitat, the, you know, the, the, you know, which one do you enter it into and that kind of thing. So, well, I think, yeah. the, I think the key point there to make, guys, is, is that for those out there watching tonight and are inspired by what they're seeing and thinking, I'd like to give this a crack either in this competition or other future competitions, from my almost 20 years experience of entering competitions, the first thing you must do is you must, before you do anything else, is print out the rules, go through them with a highlighter and mm -hmm. understand what is critical in order to make sure that your entry is correct, mm -hmm. not only in terms of the technical stuff as in, you know, the file size and whether you need to label the um, file, et cetera, et cetera. But it's, it's exactly that. It's looking at each category and saying, does my image qualify or is it the best suited for this particular category? Because at the end of the day, you don't want to, you know, disqualify yourself simply because you haven't gone to that effort of yeah. understanding what animal behavior is and what they're going to be looking for, as well as going through past galleries. Mm. First thing I do is go through the past galleries and go, all right, what's this, what's this category all about? Oh yeah. Okay, great. I've got a few images for that yeah. versus no, nah, I've got nothing in that category. So whilst I thought I had something, my, my images aren't going to stand up there. So yep. therefore I'll, I'll, I'll save them for something else or I won't bother with this, these, those particular images for that particular competition. So I think it's critical for you to do a bit of homework first to give yourself the best chance of doing well in these competitions. Yeah, definitely. And, and the, this website's great, the SA Museum website, because you actually do have all these way back to 2009 that you can refer to. So there's there's plenty of research there, I suppose, in terms of what's been uh, what, what, and, what's been in those categories. And, and as we always say in the uh, finance world, of which I'm not a part of, is that fast, the past, uh, past performance does not you know indicate future performance, so to yeah. speak, either. So at the end of the day, it's only a guide. Yeah. You can't go right Tim rate one with a set of aerials in the portfolio category this year. So there are four, I'm going to, going to stack my entries full of aerials next year and win the portfolio category as well. It doesn't work that way. Okay. And it's almost so. in, in some ways it might be less likely because, you know, that the judges might've seen that that was last year and want to give a different kind of theme well, a go. Well, well so. and, and that worked in Tim's favor this year because both Paul and I have shied away. Not to say that we would have. <laughs> <laughs> it came out really poorly. Yeah. Tim, yeah. Oh, no, look, it, it is a, it I, is a good you know, It happens when. <laughs> but, but, when... You know, in, in, you, but what I'm trying to say is that in past years, I've entered aerials and they've not done well at all. They've not been shortlisted at all. So therefore I've gone, okay, materials yeah. perhaps aren't a thing for this particular competition. Yeah. I'm, I'm, you know, wrapped as minties more than anyone else to see Tim win. He absolutely deserves to. So oh, we'll, we'll no doubt, we'll no, no doubt um, get to that. There's but, an um, exemplary set of images. So let's, um, let's, let's move get on started, boys. And yes, I would sir. love to see a, a, a specific aerial category in these competitions. Yeah. Please, if you're watching Geo. Make a separate aerial category so you can take them away from the landscape category. So I'm, <laughs> I'm not competing against that sort of stuff. Because it's like to get up some flights, Nick. That's all. Uh, yeah. No, no, uh. no. It's a completely <laughs> different kettle of fish. So come on. <laughs> yeah. All right. So um, we've I've gone through this category. Um, is there anything that you guys want to see again in particular? Um, yeah. Can we look at the um, the spider and fly one, please? Yeah. Yeah. We'll just um, bring that one up a bit bigger. There we go. Yeah, so I actually see um, all the detail there. I um, yeah, oh, it's it's amazing, and that's what I wanted to bring up because technically this is the most incredible photograph um, in, in, in this category. I've, yeah. I've re read the description. It's by Ben Clark from Western Australia, and congratulations, Ben, if you're watching. It's an absolutely magnificent photo. But I, I just don't quite understand how he's managed to do it because it says here quite clearly that he's it's a handheld 24 image it's stitch. Big with extension tubes and a macro flash going. So I'm not quite sure how he's managed to pull it off, um, but the fact he has is just incredible. It's the, the, it, There mustn't have been any movement uh, or very much movement between the frames, but to have a 24 image stitch at macro so what, handheld, um, that's incredible. So what you're saying there is he's used focus stacking 
to to capture yeah. the depth of field in that image with the twenty yes. image stack. Right. And how how he's done that without subject movement handheld and using a flash each time. I'm, I'm it's I'm ridiculous. Quite... Oh, <laughs> with the flash as well, of course. I just well, the, the, flash, the flash would freeze the frame, but then you've got to line up each of the frames in order to. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just a technically extreme, extreme example of macro um, that is, you know, it's it's almost unbelievable. Um, yes. And, and all the parts little... that you want to be in focus are in focus as well. And, and the parts yeah. you don't really need aren't, so it's really well yeah. selectively. It's the sharpness in that image, besides the fact that he's able to capture this unique moment, but the sharpness in that image is just out yeah. off the charts. Yeah, yeah. it is. Yeah, there's... Seeing oh, it it's amazing. Yeah. up front like that, yeah. And again, unless you, you have that specialist knowledge, you might not understand just how incredibly difficult it is oh. to create that. Like there's there's a lot of spatial depth of field in this image and to get all of that in sharpness is impossible in a single frame for starters. And it's just uh, five millimetres in size, so you have to get pretty close to get that kind of... Um, that's unbelievable. Yeah, mm. With a 100 mil macro. So, yeah, very, very well done there. It sounds like it's a lot of, um, lot of length, by the way. favorite votes with that one. one. Um, I, I did, I did love the uh, octopus in the. In oh, the, the, that, the that one! As I soon think, as I saw, I saw that one as an entry, I think um, that's just, it's just absolutely that's my pick. The lighting as well. Um, the lighting is really makes it. Um, but um, just like Level having a cuddle up in the, well. in the shell. Um, the photographer must have been freaking out when they saw that scene <laughs> to photograph. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I, I, I don't have. Well, I have a deep appreciation for underwater photography because I think photography is hard enough when you're doing it above water, let alone having to be below water where you're having to deal with currents and poor light, et cetera, and, and breathing, for goodness sake, and then creating a beautiful, stunning image like that, I think mm. is incredible. I, I just I can't understand how they do it so well. Mm. It's, it's incredibly um you know, um, technical in order to get a shot like that, uh, let alone capture a special moment like that mm. and yeah. uh, obviously really well across the lighting with the strobe and snoot on the strobe to really direct the um the light onto the subject there and so i'm sure there's plenty going on behind but by using the strobe and the flash he's just isolated the subject like that as if it was in a studio or something like that mm -hmm. so the snoot, um, snoot flash which is why you managed to focus it so specifically and also it's only two inches in diameter this octopus so it's a really really tiny creature oh, wow. really yeah yeah that's, that's I, i'd like to sense the sense of, of nurture and safety and and the way it's even like wrapping its arms around itself almost mm. in that, that space of a lot of it just feels like a nurturing space in, in terms of an aesthetic and from an almost artistic sort of aesthetic and i think it's kind of unusual and it speaks to the element of protection you know it's using the bivalve as, as an area to to keep it safe and its body language is, is speaking to that at the same time mm. and the color palette between the two works really beautifully and the isolation with the flash is very successful and, and brings it into a different it'll be quite distracting having, having other elements around it i think in this case mm. uh, but there's enough to give it a context yeah, absolutely. and the granular nature of the skin on the octopus as well as the granular nature of the um the, the sand thing. around it, I think, is a nice sort of alliteration. Yeah, sort well. of like the, that's what the octopus does, isn't it? it? Sort of matches its surroundings. Holes in his groove. This is great. Yeah. Oh my god! It's oh, like it's, I just um, want to tape all of this. Can I get a, a, can I get a, a transcript of tonight's episode, please? It's very it was long. Scott group. actually, who was on, who was on the show, so um, a few weeks ago. So oh, good, Nick. Um, beautiful mud skipper shot there, Scott. How's the timing on a shot like that? Uh, and and also yeah. too, how's the, the anticipation? How, How's the stunning lighting of the um sorry just, tack sharp man. It's tack sharp and yeah. the depth of fields like nothing but then how's the stunning lighting on the whale flute as well not the flute. oh this one here yeah how's the lighting in that uh, that is gorgeous that'd be hard to focus on it too you'd think um because it's not really anything solid there to, but then the... putting it against that beautiful dark background and having that shaft of light you know the handheld from that a boat moment. that's not particularly easy to do oh. that's that's just gorgeous <laughs> i mean it, it's it's not as aesthetically pleasing as some of the others and it doesn't sort of jump out at you straight away as being a oh my god shot but by the same token technically that's pretty hard to get yeah it's magic yeah. magic um any other comments um, before we move on at all? I mean, well, I think that this amazing. this one here that you just got your cursor on, like that's that's a beautifully anticipated moment as well. I think, and that combination of 
of of shapes and and movement and dynamism of, of all these different species at the same time I, I think is is quite stunning and it's beautifully flamed, framed by the the negative space and the blues in the, in the background on the left and right which gives a bit of a depth as well and yeah. that kind of circular oval flow that brings your eye around and the linear kind of movement of the fish that's matched by the linear stripes on their yeah. side it, yeah. you know different color palettes bouncing off each other it's it's um Visual really striking. beautiful look straight yeah. shot yeah no magic magic should um, we uh should we move on guys I'm yes we'll just see what, what the winners were with that category um so i can just tick this and have a look yeah, so we, we discussed so, before the show that we, we kind of pick our own and then we go back and actually look and see what the actual winners were. So yeah. I, I don't actually know what they all are myself, so that's quite interesting for us. Yeah, so these were these two were the um, winners. Winner, runner-up, is that how they do it? What was that? Sorry, Paul? Is one the winner and one the runner-up? Yeah, so I two? believe um, the first yes, one, there's the winner. that's the winner there. And it will that's have the seahorse giving birth. Isn't yeah. that incredible? Yeah. Oh, it's just an amazing moment. It's just wow. so precious. Um Absolutely magnificent. Look at their little eyes on the, on yeah. the that's yeah. incredible. That's just glorious. Wow. And it's, it, and it's, probably, the... it's probably worth saying with this image, it hasn't got the same spectacular lighting uh, that the runner up Scott, for example. Um, but this is about this competition and, and, and how it sometimes works. Um, it's the, this is animal behavior, and, and to capture something so special and precious like this is immediately elevated this shot up to, uh, in the judge's opinion, the, the winning image. But um, it's different to the, 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 the runner-up in terms of the way it's been lit and that sort of thing. Uh, one's uh, certainly a bit more planned and the other one's a bit more Spotlight. spontaneous, but, yeah. but capturing an absolutely uh, you know, magnificent moment. And, and interestingly, they're both, um, both uh, underwater photos. In fact, I think maybe six out of the ten are... Uh, well, I think there's 11 in the category. Um, well, there's more than that, actually. Six. Yeah, quite a few are underwater. There's 14 in that one, and uh, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight that are based on marine life. So yeah. it's, um, it's yeah, really cool. It's just, yeah. Fantastic. Beautiful work. All right. Well, that's the animal behaviour category. It gives you a good, a good vibe for what, what gets entered in that one as well. Um, we'll move on to animal habitat and I'll just go through them all really quickly. Hmm. Wow. All right, so that was the images very, very quickly. Um, one thing I noticed straight up is that, the, you know, there's, a, there's no, people aren't afraid to, to show habitats that aren't traditional habitats. Um, yeah, there's a few of those in there, isn't there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. which is, um, which is you know, this is um, that's quite a, that's quite a, a large shed. proportion, actually. One, two, three, four uh, of the category, at least, are um, sort of showing, a, you know, a human-influenced habitat there. So, and that's, that's in the rules. Um, the rules state the image must show an animal or animals in the environment it lives in. This can yep. be natural or built environment. The animal, either native or feral, has independently claimed as its habitat. But captive species are not allowed. So mm. nothing in a cage, but um, but certainly anything living in a human environment is um, fair game for this um, category. Nick, yeah, and I think um, standard also... Across, sorry, go. is that standard across the whole competition? None of the... Uh, animals can be in captivity. But absolutely. Yeah. 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 No, no zoo animals, no pets. Um, I don't know about pet that because some uh, of our palmer's entries are from, um, are from uh, the animal park. I think animal yeah. portrait might allow for that, but I'm, I'm, okay. I'm not a, I don't normally look at those categories. So I'm not, not entirely I, sure. I could be wrong. Yeah. Um, he's got a few from Bonnerong and he's named um, it up in the entries. So, yeah. So okay. let's, um, uh, okay. <clears throat> if you have a look at, uh, at that bird of paradise there, Luke. This one here. That's yeah. one I'd like to comment on just straight away because I do have a background in this. Um, 
about 10 years ago, I went to West Papua specifically to photograph birds of paradise. Um, spent yeah, good luck with that. Hiking through the jungles of, of the West Papua remote uh, um, mountains. And it is extremely difficult to get a decent shot of these birds. One, oh, yeah. one more than anything else, it's, look, they, they, they sometimes build specific hides and they, they know where the clearing is for these animals that come down, the males that come down and display, you know, much like a bowel bird would do similar sort of um, family and genre species of birds, etc. But as you'll note here by Kevin, who's taken this photograph, ISO 3200, you're down at the bottom of this rainforest and there's bugger all light involved and it's really hard to get a good shot. Um, you know, that, that, that 3200 would be difficult to blow up to be a really nice big print, but it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, he's captured a beautiful moment and that is a very unique bird. I mean, bloody hell, I'd love to see that one, the Wilson's Bird of Paradise. Look at the colour on it. It's out of this world. This is the sort of stuff that gets featured in, um, you know, David Attenborough documentaries because yeah. of the uniqueness of these animals and their behaviour, but extremely difficult to get a decent photo based on light alone, if nothing else. It's incredible how iridescent the... Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's not much. using a flash, is he? So that no. light reflection is quite astounding. Yeah, handheld hundreds of a second. I know, you know that's pushing it big time. Yeah, One hundred three hundred mil lens. He's no doubt. I say thirty two hundred. He probably had no stabilizer choice. happening yeah. left, right, and center in order to be able to crack a good one on and that. Pretty much these, wide open. He couldn't do much they, better. Yeah. And these guys don't stop still. They move around heaps. You know, they dart backwards and forwards, and they're always carrying on doing their display, which is incredible to watch, but very difficult to photograph. So it's just probably one, that, that one area where video is so much easier, isn't it? Because you <laughs> yeah, a little bit perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and again, the judges, uh, or there's certainly specialist judges that are uh, in this competition that would know that that's a difficult thing to capture and have probably rewarded that um, as a finalist um, partially yeah, based on the fact it's so difficult to do. Yeah. Um, so, yes. That's a, Cute. I love the um, eyes on this one. Um, the, the different, the, especially the color contrast between the the two that colors there. But. Is that how your eyes are going to look tomorrow at the end of tomorrow? Oh, who knows? Probably, <laughs> probably <laughs> not. Yeah. I, I, I had that on the weekend, so. All right. Uh, okay. Probably, yeah. I will catch up I, after. I'm going to jump to the one of the the frog and the ghost mushroom. Yeah, I was going to. Uh, how gonna good is that? that? Yeah. yeah. Like it's a it's a thirty second exposure. Like from what I can see, I think it just says thirty, and it's yeah. uh, in order to get a long enough exposure, maybe to pick up the um, the glow from the bioluminescent yeah. fungi, as well as the, the stillness and frozen crispness and sharpness. Yeah. And it's you know off camera flash, so it's probably handheld or um, you know, and so that must be a very very still frog. But mm. that, it's just an unusual combination to be able to mix the lighting of, of that ambient and flashlight so beautifully, and, and get a long enough exposure um, to get. The luminescence from from the fungi at the same time is really intriguing. What about the thing about the inclusion of quite a bit of um, negative love space it. up the top? I, love yeah, it. I think I it really adds to it. I think yeah. it, it gives it another element and it kind of brings out the darkness and the eyes of the frog a lot more that would be lost a little bit more if it was sort of cut off. Um, and it adds oh. a different sort of heaviness and weight and space to the top that, that wouldn't be there otherwise for, mm -hmm. for you to kind of sit with the the luminescence as well, which would be distracted by a background um, that, that that might have um, that might have taken away if there was more to it. Mm. And off camera flash too. So obviously um, has experimented a fair bit with different angles there as well to try and get the best lighting effect. Yeah, I noticed in the rules that were a lot of the images that I read that there is a lot of off camera flash being used, and mm. a lot of it's saying handheld as well. So that's 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 something that's that's uh, the hard earned. Uh, expertise i think definitely definitely all right um cool um look, well, any any other one to look at with that one before we move on and, and look at the it, it, do you think now do, does anyone have a sort of pick there out of I, that category yeah i i really enjoyed the, the last one as well actually i think the the, at the bottom of the page of the sharks oh yeah the i just shark think the, the the curves and the dynamism and the movement and, and the drama and the way your eye can just flow through this scene in, in both a, a curvaceous sensual way and a dynamic energetic way at the same time, I find that really intriguing. And that kind of luminescent kind of glow that runs through from front to back uh, with, with the lighting and, you know, the, the stirred up sediment just sort of adding to the story of, of just the, the power and the moment of these creatures. And, um, yeah, that's a very telling image for me. Mm. Got a gorgeous colour palette. Mono too, yeah, beautiful colour palette. 
Yeah, it really. Yeah, it could work pretty well in mono as well. I agree. Yeah. Um, all right. Yeah, well, I think my favourite would be the the this one here. I think with the night light. Um, anyone else have a comment there at all? Uh, this top right one. I think the the aesthetic and, and the cleverness of of having that contextual sort of background to, to such a delicate sort of creatures, you know, so this like floating almost in the ether. Mm. Uh, I found that incredibly intriguing and it, and it speaks to the delicacy of the, the creatures themselves and the thoughtfulness of, of the, the perspective and the positioning that the shots were taken from. I follow her on real. Instagram. She produces some brilliant bird photography. Yeah, Georgina is awesome. Yeah. 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 And, she's and quite she commonly she's um, in the competition. Very, <laughs> very, she, um, Oh, she's a yeah. consistent one, yeah. Very consistent, yeah. And she yeah. looks like she was runner up here as well. So right. it's a oh, for those tech yeah. fans, it's it's worth going through and looking at what, what lenses people are using because there's a few consistent ones. And the old uh, 100 to 400 uh, Canon Mark II is is, a, is quite a good, uh, not entry level one, but a very good all round kind of lens for for this sort of work. And she's indicating that she's zoomed out. She she actually deliberately has zoomed out. So she was probably going for the 100. individual um, birds and then has realized that there's a, a better composition wider. And so has, mm. has actually, I think she uses quite a, it might, might be a five or 600 mil from memory. We might see in some other ones. She's a 500 in. mil F4 lens is very popular amongst the bird photographers because mm. um, the 600 is just a bit too heavy, which requires oh, yeah. a tripod, whereas the 500 can be handheld, um, you know, depending on how strong you are, but it's a favoured lens as well, the 500 yeah, F4. Okay. Um, I've heard of guys using it on, uh, guys and girls using them on boats, you know, for pelagic trips to shoot oh, yeah. seabirds, for example, as well. So, yeah, anyway, we move on. Cool, cool. Well, um, yeah. Um, the winners. In terms of the winners, um, it was actually these two. Well, that was the runner-up as we saw, and then this was the winner. Right. Um, so we've got um, yeah. just a flock of galahs around... Um, some trees out in the I guess the, there's a beautiful sort of arc shape here going on but also um, the story I think the stories yeah. what's what's had that elevate that to the win um, not even knowing the, the the story there that's written by the winner but um, yeah. just the story that the image tells mm. very Australiana yep. interesting too very um, uh, you know um, entry-level um, camera there so there's no um, there's no doesn't um, doesn't need to be doesn't anything. mean anything Fabulous. doesn't mean no. anything so um so no. that's good all awesome. right cool well we'll move on to the next category which is um, animal portrait um, some beautiful shots here I've noticed that Paul's dropped out so he mightn't be sure what's going on when he joins us but um we'll um we'll press on anyway um, Mm. Bloody keys. <laughs> Wow. All right. So that was that category. Um, yeah. Any thoughts um, or comments, guys? Uh, I'd like to start off with the powerful owl there in the middle of yeah. the top there. Um, I'm trying to think whether or not I've seen a powerful owl. You've, have you had David on your show? We have had David on the show, yes. Yeah, yeah right. I, I haven't seen that episode. I must do that. Yeah, but, um, but they're idea. difficult. I think I'm gathering this is a daylight shot. Um, they're, they're usually right at the top of trees and they're really hard to – to spot a little and get close to. So he's used a 500 mil F4, like I was talking about with a 1.4 converter. So what does that take it up to? Um, 54, 700 mil. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, but to just get that catch light in the eye, that's what we're always looking for as um, animal slash bird photographers and, and powerful hours are known for the beautiful iridescent yellow eyes. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's a, that's a gorgeous picture. I mean, um, if I was to print that myself, I'd if that was my image, I'd be almost darkening the outside of it even more and making it even more mysterious, you know. But um, yeah. or just emerging from the shadows, oh. yeah, mm. yep. oh. yeah, fantastic. Well, yeah, brilliant image, David. I love the one next to it, um, the um, uh, the 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 orange bird. Oh, the region, region bow bird, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just love oh. the um, the the, f the fact that it's uh. They've blended the uh, bird into the the blackness of the 
the background that just works so well as a graphic sort of image. And it's yeah. really, from memory, they're like the black is very black on those birds, so it's not um, taking it too far either. Um, is that right, Tom? Like it's almost like yeah. an iridescent black. that they, you know. I, haven't, I haven't seen these birds a lot, um, yeah. just briefly up at Lamington, nothing in the wild even. I think it's been while I've sort of been sitting at breakfast and they come down to the feeder tables. But yeah. Um, I'm actually impressed. These are beautiful birds. Don't get me wrong. I'm impressed that they've actually shortlisted this because technically it's not the strongest image or technically it's not a correct image. I should say, I think it's a very strong image. Don't get me wrong. I love it. But generally speaking, this would probably be marked down because hold on. I can't see the outline of the bird, the birds fading into the background, but that's what makes it so good. So I'm so pleased to see that this has actually been rewarded. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's very clever. There's a creative, yeah. There's a yeah, creative yeah, very clever, tool. very abstract. Yeah. I like it more the the more I look at it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Hmm. Um, anything else um, to comment? I like on? the I like the Kia. I mean, you know, like um, they can be very friendly birds. I I'm just yeah, taken with a 17 to 50 mil lens, so you know, it's right up close. Yeah, but. But that, that's Roy's Peak, I think, overlooking... Uh, yeah, that, that looks like about right. Just, yeah, yeah. yeah um, you know, like it's actually got a very sort of comical look on its face um, and, and it's a nice portrait uh, in the landscape, you know, so it's not yeah. a typical sort of close-up, you know, here's the, the, the head and the shoulders type thing. So um, I can see why that's been shortlisted. Mm. Yeah, I thought this was really well taken too because these guys don't move slowly. Um, no. to be able to pick up something like that. and um, although, although technically I have a bit of an issue in it in a sense that I'd love the negative space to be on the right rather than on the left. Yep. So for me, if I was entering this into a competition, I'd, I'd probably either crop out what's on the left to sort of even that out or mm -hmm. even crop it as a bit of a pano, you know, and yep. have it be – it feels like it's a very sort of slender, fast-moving, you know, image. So therefore the – Cropping it in a panoramic format might accentuate that oh, speed, yeah, for example. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, cool. Anyway. I mean, I, um, I like the um, the nocturnal nightmares down the bottom. Um, the it's, What is it? It's a stargazer fish. Yeah, that one. Oh, on, this the one on the left. On the left there. Oh, this one here. Yep. Yeah, quite a yeah. unique sort of shot there. And it's um, special techniques to show off its biofluorescence or bioluminescence or fluorescence. Um, yeah, no, it's just really different. That's uh, yeah, a very very interesting image. <laughs> yeah, this is taken in Indonesia, uh, so that's part of the geographic area that this competition. Yeah, comes it's in. under the yep. Wallace line. So um, Wallace line. It, right. it, if you look up the Wallace line, you'll see where that I'll is. Look it up. That shows where. It, I I don't know what what um I can't remember off the top of my head what that Wallace line means, but it's um to do with the separation of. Uh, where different continents were that, that had different um, uh, evolution patterns. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's, it's a it's bio, bio yeah. region, and is yeah. that, that how it works. It's sort of yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, one I, one that I find the most stunning uh, personally is this one here, yeah. um, and um, just maybe from a technical aspect, because obviously there's very little light in the order to capture this. Um, handheld manual exposure manual focus obviously autofocus wouldn't be doing too much in that sort of um um sort of light um mm -hmm. so to time this moment um and um sort of create a bit of a narrative around it is is quite nice i think so i guess yeah. i'm always drawn to the more night shots and and that one's very emotive i think I think uh, that comes across as perhaps not being as striking as some of the other images, but as you've discussed, technically that's a difficult shot to get. You'd be happy to get that shot any day of the week. Oh yeah, absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. So all Should right. we have a look at the winners? Yeah. Well, let's have a look at the winners. Um, and um, there we go. So we've got, um, that was animal portrait. That was the winner. winner. Right. Yeah. Okay. And then we've got the runner up, which right. was the one I was talking about there. So surprises me that the Albatross picture won, and not to take anything away from the winner, but um, I thought I thought there were some other images there that were uh, more striking than that. But there you go. That's It'd be it. interesting to see what um, what their um, or, or hear what their discussion was on that. Mm. Yeah, because they they may you know because of what exactly what you said from. The, the point of view of it leaving the frame as opposed to having the negative space so I can go into the frame. Mm. Um, yeah, it's but, it really but is like that, look at how sharp it is. Technical, yeah. yeah, it's very, very um, you can see very that it's, well executed. It's in I remember, um, I was actually with Scott Patelli on a trip 
not long ago, and he actually said, like, F7.1 is a really good aperture to try and get the entire bird sharp like that. Like, right. you, you're sort of tempted to go a bit shallower so you can keep your shutter speed up, mm. but then you, you'll often only get a part of the bird in focus. So so 7.1 is a, is a bit of an ideal to aim for, but because um, that's not a super high shutter speed, 1640th for a flying bird, but so there must have been yeah, panning. He's probably panning, yeah, maybe. They're um, panning, but also, too, that bird, if it's flying into any sort of wind, it'll, it's probably, oh, it looks like, yeah. I'm not I'm not familiar with this bird enough to know whether it'll hold its wings like that if it's only gliding. It may be it may be just gliding okay. into the wind. So yeah, I've said a bit of light. Like, ISO 800, um, 1640. It's not with a 7.1. It's that he had a light on his like it wasn't really bright like, yeah pretty the, bright so that's the, always handy. the geek in me um looks at the uh the feathers on the bird and knows that it's in it's about to do a primary wing molt there because of the the tattiness of the uh <laughs> feathers there oh very, very nice. good tom i would have yeah. picked that yeah. Yeah. yeah cool all right well we'll move on to botanical nick's um old haunt oh um all right I, so... I have one of these on my wall by the way oh well, there you go oh do, oh, do you <laughs> i do all right. Okay. We got to. Oh, we'll try and pick which one. I have this one. Uh, I bet. Yeah, I bet. Yeah, Matt I, Palmer. I yeah. Already. Oh, <laughs> love that one. Beautiful. Wow. Wow. This. Oh, the Jess. Yeah. Well, some goodies. Nice one. So that's the that's the category. A few less images in, in that one that, that came through. Um, I'll speak anyone... to the one on my wall if you want. Yeah, like this is... Um, yes, um, go, Paul. Speak to us about this. This actually one. was uh, an entry uh, in the app. Is like, it's the kind of image that has the artistic aesthetic to do really well in, in, a, um, in a more sort of artistic oriented sort of competition as well as the scientific aspect i've driven past this tree many times myself and and as you'll see in the description that that photograph no longer exists anymore because those trees behind it have all been clear felled yeah. um, but matt's quite clever in that he that he has a 600 watt uh, flash that he uses quite often in broad daylight and in this case i think it was more dusk but he's actually used it to really bring out the the qualities mm -hmm. uh, of this wattle and help separate it from the background beautifully and yet chosen exposure to that gives it an encapsulated almost gladiatorial kind of wraparound feel and dimensionality at the same time uh, so it's 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 a very simple but very elegant and very well thought out capture mm. it really brings out the yellows in the in the um flowering wattle there too so mm. probably was taken at a similar time of year to now actually um, yeah. even it, it's wattle season it's yeah. a sort of it's a sort of image that you you possibly could do um to agree with post-production um but that level of post-production is not allowed in this competition mm. so matt's extremely clever use of the flash has allowed him to get that the, the darkness behind and, and and highlight the tree um with you know a photographic technique as opposed to a, a post-production technique because when i first saw it um i thought oh gee uh matt you've uh You've pushed the boundaries of the competition there in post production, <laughs> um, but um, you, but one of the great aspects is again you get the explanation um, with this competition, and it makes perfect sense. And uh, yeah, no, well done, mate. It's uh, fantastic. Matt was uh, Matt was going to join us tonight, um, but he 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 said Mika's on a show and their microphones clash. <laughs> <laughs> she she got first dibs. Uh, yeah, right. But we did ask him pretty late, so it's fair enough. This bird on the wire one's interesting. Um, what's going on there? Uh, uh, yeah, if, if I could afford a 300-2.8, I'd get one. <laughs> is, it, is it actually sitting on something or is, what's it doing? Uh, we'll have a quick, we'll have a better. That's why the title comes a bird on a wire. It's jumping from one to the other. Yeah, right. It's just taken off from it. just makes it look like it's hovering. It's taken off or hopping from one to the other. It's interesting that it hasn't got its wings out at all. So Yeah. It might uh, be later. just like jumping from one to the other or the, the gentleman who's taken this is is well known in the industry. He and his um, dad wrote one of the f best and first field guides um, That's right. that I purchased um, years ago. I still got it on my bookshelf somewhere. Um, one of my favourites, and he he's um, been photographing Australian wildlife and um, and landscapes etc. for many many years. I, I love his work. Mm. Awesome. And yes, he's um, certainly featured in this competition over the past few years as well with his shots. So 
done, it does very well. Mm. Nicely I think they, done they, light shot there. Sort of atmospherics in, in the in the central fog shot, just this one right here, just yeah, the abstract unbelievable. Mode. Like yeah, nice. that just has such an incredibly ethereal, otherworldly quality to it. And there's this sense of like ghostliness and death, and yet there's this one figure in the center of actually a living tree that's just the last one holding on to life in this ghost land. How and, do you uh, pronounce that, Paul? Oh God. Go, Tom. No, no. I'm not I buy a lot. Yeah, yeah, well done. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. lovely, beautiful, oh, beautiful. Yeah, that's what I was. All right, say. we'll probably have to keep moving. This one um is also a bit of a standout for me. Um, yeah, and um, absolutely. The, st- the storytelling in it, like reading the description, is is really beautiful. Like yeah. it's it's talking it's, about how the ice is what's destroyed it or killed it by, and froze it and taken its life away. And yet, normally things are crushed with a big snowfall like that. And and that ice is the very thing that's kept it erect and standing up and and having its kind of stance and, and, and the space right. that it holds at the same time. The detail is just amazing as well. I, must say, I love um, I love Jeff Freestone's shot of the oh, um, yes. snow gums. We've, we've yeah, seen this on Jeff's the, been a guest of ours, yeah. Yeah, and we've seen this on the show. Um, he had this image. Um, I just love it. It's absolutely beautiful. The detail again, just yeah. unreal. Yeah. yeah really cool. We'll just have a quick look at the winners then, hey? The previous um, shot, guys, before you go on, yeah. um, the, the one that you were looking at, uh, the frozen one up in the top, no, the top left. Yeah. Um, Charles Davis, you want to follow his work? He actually Absolutely. Had, he had a shot in the first category that we looked at, which had the kookaburras sitting in the tree while it was snowing. So Charles lives up that way and specialises in doing animal portraits in particular in snow and um, and has a beautiful collection of images. And, uh, and yeah, we'll have to try and really get him well on the show, for that. I think. Yeah, really well known for that, I think that? he just did a story um saying that it, he's got um eight um of the of the final books, meaning he's made it like a final oh, right. finals eight times in a row. Does with surprise it. me. Yeah. Not surprising at all. Yeah, he's very, very um, commonly a feature in, in the competition. Yep. Um yeah, and so the oh, winners, and the winners are, are, da, 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 da. those two. Ah. Uh, we didn't um, actually touch on the ghost mushroom one, but um I think there was a few oohs and ahs when it came up. Yeah, um, Callie's actually Callie. come across her based in um on, through the focus it's, group in Sydney. In Sydney, um, yeah, she's yeah. a very talented photographer. Extremely, yeah. And she she does very well in the focus awards every year. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, strikes very, me very most talented. about that shot is it's taken in the uh, Belangelo State Forest, which um as a forensic person, <laughs> uh, be careful strikes you. chills into my heart. So well no, done, yeah, being really out there. Really yeah. You, you yeah. mean she wasn't wandering around there by herself, or she wouldn't want Ooh. to? Uh, oh no, we uh, we yeah, I won't go into it. You, you know, uh, we all know the Ivan Malat story. So. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, uh, that's sorry, I, I shouldn't have brought that up. We're talking about images. But, um, <laughs> This is always, um, well, always atmospherics, bit, atmospherics, and it gives it an extra atmospheric for me. Mm. <laughs> I always feel a bit funny when I see images like images in a nature competition taken in a sort of a, a, a plantation. Um, I don't know yeah. if anyone that that bothers anybody else, but at all, and not not trying to take away from the the great image, but just more so around um, you know, is that actually nature or not? Is is I guess the commentary point there. Oh, but, um, controversial, Luke. Jesus, yeah. listen to you. <laughs> Stirring up trouble again. I know, I know. I can't help it. Um, so all right, beautiful moving image. right along. If you um, want to do well in competitions, have something that glows in the dark. Yeah, well, <laughs> or it's mushroom. a point of difference, really, and it's the wow factor for the judges, something they haven't yeah. seen before. So, yeah. um, and if curiosity. You, um, and don't forget also, it's going in exhibition. So, you know, that, that's um, imagine all the kids going through and seeing that sort of stuff as well. I don't know if the judges actually think about that, but... um. It works very well for something like that. Mm. Look at quick look at the juniors and and um, just quickly. So, what's classified, that. Nick? A junior? What age are we talking here? Okay, so junior, uh, the entrant must be under eighteen years of age at the date of close of entries. Entries must fit the criteria of any of the other nine categories. Um, photographers under eighteen years are only eligible to enter junior category and are not eligible for the overall prize. Right. And I must say, this year the junior category is probably the highest standard I've 
I remember from the last few years. It's um, it's it's always a very very high standard. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, like the, um, but this some of the clever flash work. This is pretty yeah, special. Robert Robert Irwin made it. Robert in Irwin. Well. Yeah. Yes, I was going to comment. So he's taken yeah. this shot as well as the uh, black fronted plover, which is the shot next to this one here. And I'm like, hold on, I thought he was older than 18, but he's not. He's 17 years old. Oh, and really? He, wow. Um, he's making really good progress as a photographer and mm. he has actually featured in the natural history museum awards and flew over there a few years ago mm. to be at the award ceremony there in london so um he's certainly one to keep an eye on he's you're going to see his name crop up all the time now because um he's a very good photographer yeah, yeah and he's, like he's been um, out of here yeah mm, he's been in the junior category, category a couple of times already before so right yeah, yeah so he's been um, I met him. Um, I met him um, over when I flew over to Adelaide. Um, so that must have been 2017, I think. So that would have been. He would have only been 14 when he, he was in the junior category. Then. 13, 14. Yeah, 14. Um, wow. he's, throwing a, he's throwing a 500 mil f4 lens around there, so that's not uh, anything to shy away from. Right. I, I love this. The lucky, colours lucky. in this one here. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's isn't magic, it? isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, and, uh, aesthetic, right. aesthetically, from the, the shape and the, and the colour and the sort of ethereal aspect of it's going on. Here? <laughs> I know, what's going on? Yeah. It's, it's, it's a beautiful the, image, but the, also um, the... The text is, um, yeah, didn't really explain exactly what's going on, but yeah, it's, yeah, magic, awesome. beautiful colours. Yeah, all right. Well, we'll see oh. um, how we went with the um, winners. And we've got the sulphur crested. Uh, as the as runner up. up, well, that's a very clever image. I mean, at the end of the day, it's a very common bird, and um, and yet the lighting in that is just gorgeous, yeah. Yeah. and it's purposely being underexposed in order to create that that mood and effect. And so, yeah, well done. To and Aiden. and but, you know, the framing, the use of negative space as well um, is a little bit quite thoughtful. Yep. Uh, in that regard, to to it like the frog with the um, glowing mushrooms as well, yep. isn't it? Having that, it makes it as much about geometry and shape and light as, as it does about the subject itself. Because it's probably the rule of thirds there. Exactly too, what then. I was going to say, yeah. Paul. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah no, cool. And then this is um, <laughs> the best winner. Best dress, right? Nice Beautiful um, detail. Lichen Huntsman. That that'd be a um, pretty in, in, amazing. Um, like it just looks like it's physically it's just blended in and part of the tree. It's just insane. You, yeah. you and I'd walk past that every day of the week. We, I, oh, I yeah. would, never, I would never see that. Yeah, it's I mean like, that was my next thought: is who, who would have even seen it? You know. Yeah, that's what amazes me about some of these photographers, particularly the macro stuff, because if you're not looking in that frame of view, you can just walk past so much stuff and not even seen it. Mm, that's a beautiful image. I love that. Well done. All right. So we'll move on now to the next one. And we got landscape. Oh, well done to everyone in that category. What, yeah, what a, brilliant. What a great testament to the future of, of, of the craft in Australia. Yeah. Australia. There's Carly again. Some guy called Cameron Blake. <laughs> Will Patino. Will Patino. Hey. Dan Marcus. Oh, Christmas. Huh? Unbelievable. Oh, oh, such a strong Blake. category. Far out. Well, again, you know, Kingdom, yeah. Oh, oh, take me back. We should be that. there, Tom. Wow. Yep. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Can't beat a bit of bio. I will talk about that shot in a second. Yeah. Was it on one of your workshops, Tom? No, no, no. I don't know the photographer. Oh, but, we'll pull pull um, this one up. Sends your, your. No, no. The other one next to it, the lake. Oh, okay. This one yeah. here. Okay. Yeah, like, Warming Grave is one of my favorite things on planet Earth to photograph. And. To actually physically be able to witness the the water moving down the channel like live, you can almost watch it. Is is like something Mercury or something? Something yeah. to to that you'll never be able to experience sort of anywhere in the world. Just about. Um, it's just that, mind bending. Yeah, I, I don't know what's going on down here to the right, Tom. I've never seen that happen on the lake. I think this is just a very strong wind that's just pushing up ah, some sort of yeah. dust. And that's um, fun up and in that's the plane, created that. Yeah. And, it almost and looks like steam. That's why it's it does. Kind of it does, unusual. doesn't it? Yeah. And then and, you get a bit of burger or all of rain in the background, the, the separation of color from the blues, that yeah, incredible cool. striations through the central foreground, separating it away. And the way they've handled the um, the exact angle of reflection on the water to keep all the detail on there without blowing the highlights out and give it its own kind of structure and 
physical sort of presence without blowing it out and, and separate the colors is, is just perfect well i think yeah. i think you've hit the nail on the head there you'd, you'd cream your pants if you're out there photographing lake air with clouds in the first place but then to get all of that happening as well and that the way the light is coming off that the water coming into the lake oh. itself is just it, it creates this 3d effect it like really it's all, does yeah it's real like it's all like yeah. it's not like hold on a second how is that possible it all looks like it's been you know patched together various different layers of photoshop yeah, definitely and some of optical it. illusions going on for sure <laughs> Correct. the geometry of the yeah. composition is, is beautifully structured oh, as well in terms of where the lines are and, and the shapes and the curves it, everything's positioned magnificently and, if, and as you know like a composition like this and a plane would change every second yeah well, this actually says it's from a helicopter, which is unusual because you don't usually get helicopters out that way. Particularly, oh, if you're I've never flying, seen one ever. Uh, particularly if you're flying from William Creek up to that spot, the Warburton Channel, and then flying back again, you'd have to be a long way for a chopper. It's a it's long great. way for a chopper, hence why they don't run choppers out there most of the time because mm. they just don't cover enough. It allowed area. them to Ranger. get the shutter speed down quite low um, for F9, which is F9 probably is high, yeah. stopped down quite a bit for what you'd normally shoot well, out of it. wouldn't a... necessarily need F9 for a shot like that anyway, but, yeah. you know, it's nice and sharp aperture. And and at 640, I've well, shot There's down. a lot of depth of field in that photograph. Yeah. It doesn't need it. Like, you do it extreme, probably get away with it. But... Yeah, well, hyperfocal, yeah. Well yeah. done. I actually saw that shot. My first thought is trying to get a hold of this person and seeing if I wanted to do a print swap because I <laughs> love it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, you'd Amazing. be able to speak. Oh, this about. one here too. Will's um, the amount of effort that he goes into to capture these sort of aerials um is just un unreal. Yeah, it's it's a, a it's good. It says it took him a year to line up the shot. And yeah, to, to um to be able to look at the look at this detail and it's um, man aspiring, is it? I think he's got another one where the moon's directly behind. No, the I think it's deeper well. in Fjordland. Um, um, it says aspiring, though. Yeah, I think it's aspiring. Yeah, it's aspiring. aspiring. Oh, that's yeah. a lot of snow for aspiring. Yeah. Wow. That must so be he's obviously picked the, the snow, the the light, um, the fact it's a uh, close to a full moon. Um, and um, well, it have to be around a full moon to get the moon up at sunset. At that height at sunset, um, yeah. So, um, Probably the day yeah. before full moon, I reckon. I would imagine, you know, 12 months would also include a few failed attempts as well. Oh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, he's probably put a lot of dollars into and to getting flying it. at 9,000 feet. That's really quite high, actually, to, to be in a commercial oh, um, craft with nice. a window or Obviously the door. Obviously, worked out his well. angles to make sure that, you know, the peak would get up. You wouldn't be feeling your fingers if you're shooting out the window, I'll tell you that much. Because if you didn't get high enough, the moon would be obscured by the mountain, wouldn't it? So, I think I've flown at 10,000 um, before and it was getting pretty damn chilly. Yeah, yeah that would be really cold. Yeah. yeah, amazing. Um, well, like, got uh, this layers one too, which is just astounding. Um, yeah, that's feeling. That's, um, that's that's a lot of layers. Oh yeah, my God. it really reminds me of the Western Arthur Range in Tassie and some some shots that I've been able to get there. But this is just on another level. Um, it's almost like there's a couple. I don't think you'd physically get that many layers in Western Arthur's. It's just no, like no, three or four more that exist. Looks no. all very glacial like that, doesn't it? With the, mm. all of these serrated sort of mountain ridges, but. Yeah, it's just never ending, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, to get that tonal separation is magnificent. Yeah. What lens has they used? Has he used that? Um, 100, 100. Yeah, that's yeah. a cracker. That one. That's a great lens. It's quite a different, interesting choice too from a from a plane to be well, shooting so perspective long. It is, yeah. yeah, that's pretty long. Yeah, but you know, um, good on him because that's not something that people would normally carry. So you know, create something different, and you. Well, it's you really light, compressed it's all the layering beautifully, which mm, you wouldn't get in the wider lens. Yeah. That snow picture just to the bottom left there is is gorgeous too. I love the aesthetics. Oh, incredible that. atmospherics! Isn't yeah, it? it's beautiful. Yeah, and I wonder if he's used a. I don't know if I'll be able to look at this thing. If he's used a flash just to illuminate the um, the the um the foreground the snow, or um, might just no. be the natural light no, coming in no, by the looks. So. I've um, seen um, I've seen uh, Ricardo de Corner do something similar where the the you get that. Often people won't go out in this sort of weather or, or put the camera away or it's just, or sometimes the conditions are just so goddamn horrible that you don't want to, you're fighting mm -hmm. it against the conditions just to keep yourself alive, let alone take a decent photograph. But um, this has given a, a real softness to, to a, you know, a burnt fire destroyed environment, you know, like it is almost gives us like Christmas, like magical fairyland feel yeah, to the devastated yeah. forest, which is also quite, distinctive mm, yeah, very fast shutter true. speed there just to freeze yeah. the um freeze the actual freeze the snowflakes movement, yeah. in place and then the really nice, field it's probably really nice placement of the trees um you know well quite, quite deliberately yeah very well very, nice. creates that depth yeah yeah i was going to say about the the shutter speed um having 
done a few shots similar to this. You really do need that really fast shutter speed. Um, and and also, yeah, the, the telephoto aspect. You won't get this very well with a wide angle lens. So if you want to take this sort of shot, you really do need to line up a telephoto composition and then uh, make sure it's a, a, a very fast shutter speed. Otherwise, you won't um, you won't freeze the snow in the blobs that it's right there. You, you can could also get a that, nice effect yeah. with um with a slower shutter speed too, and getting small streaks. And I know oh, yeah, yeah. Pino's got some really good snow in the forest. Yeah, Ricardo's a similar too. sort of. Yeah. I think he really really worked hard on getting the right shutter speed to to get those beautiful streaks. So it's definitely a lovely thing to play with. Just yeah. the Mungo Forest run on the top left. It, what strikes me is is the moon in particular. Yeah, like Amazing, to get that in the same exposure and and handle the exposure of that moon. Um, without stuffing around with it. I don't know how that's done. And to me, that hardly even looks real. But could it's, be, um, um, perhaps it's kind of at, um, you know, uh, around sunset. Um, so you've um, got, um, we'll have a look at the commentary on it. Say it in that, yeah. The other thing is it's a, a very wide-angle shot. It's taken on a Tekina 11 to 17. Oh, the moon's quite... looking really big for a wide-angle shot. Mm. Yeah, I, yeah, I'd love to know more about that shot. Yes, yeah, so I was very intrigued, yeah, to be able to pull it off and particularly matching the exposures of, of the moon to the landscape. Really challenging thing to do. Mm. Yeah, it'd have to be um, around a bit like Will's sort of timing here where you can, the moon isn't so bright versus the landscape. Yeah, it, sort of in the it had to be a well-planned photograph to get that in one shot. Yeah. And just, I, I don't think we can go past the central blast of fire and igloo like yeah what what is that what's going on that's it um that's it using a 100 or 400 isn't it to get the moon that big yeah right anyway um Um, yeah the one in the middle is paul's referring to wow yeah Yeah. unbelievable yeah it's very unique that shot yeah it plays with my head i it's it's took me a while to work out what the hell was going on it really does it's just what a cracking sunset is it a sunset i can't remember yeah Yeah, uh, unbelievable oh, nice. light. Oh, goodness me. And then to balance that as well, um, you'd think that'd be quite oh, I think that, right is there. there a certain dome you need to use to do it? Where Scott was talking about that on, a, on our Nordic underwater show of his, that there might be a certain dome or housing you need to use to be able to do these split shots. I think you needed a um, something one. to make the, t- the bottom in focus relative to the, the top because the water's refractive index um, it makes really it. screws with the physics of the way think, light works. Yeah, yeah, I think both. the... Um, They've prioritised the sharpness for the sky a little bit there, but uh, how um, the balance, the, the lighting for the foreground and background is oh, oh, it's so tricky, unbelievable. It's shot at f fourteen, yeah. And um, I'd like to bring up there fun. is strobes being used though too, so yeah, uh, it has to be to light the foreground. It has to be, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so bring up a cam now. cam shot as well, Luke. Yeah. Um, like Peter, I've um, uh, Cam's got another shot very similar to this. Um, would have been taken on the same day, and it's just just beautiful with the the, the light backlighting a, um, a a shower storm that comes through on on Lake Pedder, and on, and the, the tones beautiful with the, the blue and the, the warm light balanced, yeah, like it is. And and the this is I mean we've talked about it before about the southwest of Tasmania and and how you, you know the weather changes so quickly, and and really from my point of view, um, it's one of the best places to get those changeable weather shots and and Cam's really mm. captured it beautifully with this this image and, and the other version he's got um, um, has a um, it's it's I think it's got a bit more a bit more of the streaks of the rain um, that are a bit more lit individually um, which um, I've seen of his before and I, I love that shot and I and love this shot too. Mm, it's a very accessible location for visitors to to go and and see the southwest and its raw beauty yeah. like that so. Yeah, really, really nice. So, well, let's have a look at the winners then and see how I'd anyone I very really strong did category. I want to just mention about this too because to get the layering of bio, I don't know. For me, I would always be hesitant to enter something in a competition for nature if I, you see all the lights and the distance and things like that. But I guess, um, you know, that it's more the, the features really the the um sea sparkle itself. Um, mm. and yeah, but it's yeah, just the getting that phenomenon getting such a lovely take on it's pretty pretty Luke, nice. your experience with shooting those type of pictures it, it never appeals like that it appears that bright in real life does oh, it? oh it's that bright in real life yeah, it sure is. Oh, yeah, yeah. you step on it um it's it's ridiculously it bright I mean, you read a newspaper sort of thing. yeah wow but that's yeah. A, what i find out about this is it's a 30 second exposure and yet it looks like a, a 
you know, the movement in the foreground of those waves is captured with a, just a more crisper or shorter shutter speed. So, mm, yeah, it sort of sits there and sort of drains out though. And yeah. depending on how thick it is, is how much um, you can see these ones are sort of um, fading off. Yeah. And then you've got these ones that are pretty fresh. So. Must have been moving quite slowly. Yeah. yeah. That is a very thick um, layer. They get, of they get really thick ones yeah. in, in Javis Bay. And, yeah. um, so I've always, when I lived in Sydney, I always wanted to cruise down whenever there was a big. Um, big sort of lot of it but yeah never never made it but i does luckily it, it got happen, it here in tassie does it happen um regularly as in you know like at the start of april or whatever else can you time it to that or not no no uh, it, i think there's um, some thought that um well it's down here it's when the the um, water's a little bit warmer yeah a bit warmer. Uh, sort of so yeah, normally right. um I, I always think around february um that sort of time of year where where you seem to get a lot more of it like we haven't had anything over winter for example so i think it's definitely yeah. tied in with water temperature yeah. at least down here um so it's yeah, so i would be always on the lookout from yeah once it starts warming up basically probably starting pretty soon Right, yeah. um, tides and all that sort of thing comes into play. It's you, you might see it during the day because it's a pink, uh, sort of a pink scum on the on the water, uh, and then you go back at night and the tides change and it's completely gone. So right. you just got to um, try your luck. Yep. So this is um interesting. We didn't really look at this image here, and that was actually the winner. Um, yeah, we so did. We've got um. Oh, that. really? We did, yeah, this slipped past us. Isn't it? Yeah. So, Can you blow that up to be bigger there, Luke? Yeah. Just looking through the full thing. It's a very busy picture, and it and it's sort of, it, um, you, I think you need to see it bigger in order to get that depth in the photograph because okay. it appears very one dimensional when you see it small like that. Mm. But you actually need to see it big in order to be able to see, you know, the depth and be able to wander to the back of the image. Yeah, a, I do find that one. Scene. Yeah, I find that one an interesting choice when you've got some stuff like um, uh, wills from the air with the ma the mountain and, and that kind of thing, but um. You know that there's always um, a rationale from the judges with those sort of things, and then yeah, this I think um, this was a bit of a favourite of ours too, the um, runner-up. So didn't look like that when I was there. <laughs> <laughs> Where was it? Thank you, Larry. Oh, no. um, oh right, of course, yeah. You cool. were in the bar at that time of night, Paul. You see, you should have been out photographing. I was probably just landing from a, a flight, Tom. That's the one. All right, let's go through monochrome, guys. Beautiful. This one's taking its time loading. Wow. Loki, how much do you find the the captions are a factor in the judging process? Well, I think um yeah, the, the 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 judges have to stop first. So there has to be enough there for the judges to even sort of want to know more. Because you know, there's so many images. If they did that to every single image, you'd be there for there's three days to to judge it, right? Wow. That's um, a long time. Like, you know, you wouldn't want to um have to be like you've got a fixed amount of time you can be there so you can't um yeah you, you have to pick and choose basically so yeah if, if there's something that oh. is pretty straightforward and and you know what it is and it's good then that will get put through to the sort of like the next round but um if you're not quite sure what's going on then you'd look at the caption so the mm. captions definitely make a difference if your image especially is a bit more abstract or people won't actually know what's going on but if people if it's not interesting enough for them to stop to start with then then um so the image this image still has to be very strong initially yeah. yeah but the caption helps um to to also um get let the judges know the level of difficulty in capturing it as well and that kind of thing so i'd definitely be talking about the effort involved in ca capturing it if, if there was um you know a unique uh, moment or things like that as well so I'd, I'd like to talk about the palm cockatoo in the top right to start with yeah being a, a birdo you don't need to know anything else about that image other than the silhouette to know that it's a palm cockatoo yeah so just love them there Amazing yeah, bird. that's why that's why um you know that's why this image is done so well because it's um it's a beautiful capture of of a, a very unique and beautiful bird and um it's just got such a distinctive silhouette that um it, you don't need to show off all of its other beautiful colors etc so and and probably not an easy shot to get because they tend to stick to the high tops of trees in the tropical areas up north so oh yeah. I can imagine that that wouldn't be an easy shot. And as you can see, the photographer, Matt. 800 mil lens. 800 mil lens. Whoa. Yeah. 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 5.6 IS. Good to see. What would that be? That'd be $15,000, $16,000 lens. Wow. That's impressive. <laughs> yeah. Not oh. sure. But uh, yeah, big piece of glass there in order to get that shot because they, they hide. And held 800 mil. 
This one. I bet you he's got guns on him. What is the head going to meet this? What is meet this guy? <laughs> that's no. I'd, I'd love to go around trying to shoot wow. those. It'd be a fantastic. Experience. This is a really strong category, though overall. Yeah. And uh, if we can bring up uh, the bottom left, um, Fractal by Jeff Freestone. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I just love this shot. Bring oh, it up big there, yeah. mate. Uh, yeah. What What is it actually of? It leaves us. Yeah. Um, no, surely not. I don't think he's actually gone into too much detail. No, yeah. he's not even giving it away. No, no. well done. It's I would imagine Creek, it's Victoria. Bark, is it? um, um, yeah, this is my type of shot. Um, it's just Cliff Creek, Victoria. I, I mean, I just say it's the it's details leaves. are astounding. Like it's just it it's hard to make all the way it through. Is. It it's like it's got a Photoshop filter on it or something though. But I don't want to cast that dispersion. No. I'd, I'd love to know more about what it is actually is we're looking at. It's like it's like a shot that um, you know William William Long has done in Photoshop. You know how he does those beautiful fractal patterns and stuff like yeah. that. But this oh, is- Jeff's on YouTube, so he's um, I don't know if he can give us any um, any um, insights. Oh, he's watching. Well, um, <laughs> <his wife's laughs> yeah. Great um, shot, Jeff. Well, oh, done, he's not on Zoom. We can get him on and yeah, ask. Yeah, no, that's all right. Um, but, we did um, invite Scott Patelli on tonight too to have a chat, but he was he uh, he gave us the photograph, but he he sat there watching it on YouTube. Another one of Jeff's here too. Oh, Jeff, um, he's taking it out, man. What's yeah, yeah, on? that's he's a brilliant his image. Monos. You know what? I think I, I think this image was inspired by a, a fellow photographer friend of mine um, by the name of Luke Sharkey, who did a, a similar shot <laughs> for the Epsom Pano Awards that year. Oh, like, oh, that bro. one was the one that that um like I, I peaked way too early with that that image, I think. But um, yeah, no, that was it's definitely <laughs> having a beautiful gum tree in the middle of a field with some massive clouds around. It's always going to that's do a well, that's I a reckon. bushfire. That's a, oh that, bushfire, right? Yeah, Jeez. yeah. Read the caption. That's going yeah, wow. yeah, that looks like a real cloud. Yeah, wow. yeah. Well, it makes sense now that I think about it. <laughs> yeah, that's that's freaking awesome and wow. and clever for Jeff to go and go right. Okay, there's this most amazing cloud, but I need some sort of foreground interest. I need some, uh, just, I need um, something to frame this with. You know, yep. Jeff's just mentioned it's thistle, um, the la- the fractal one. Right, thistle. So, thistle. Yeah. Say right. Really? Times after a yeah. long oh, I'm yeah. gonna go find me some thistle now. It's <laughs> go, it's yeah. amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, it's just brilliant, mate. That's it. Just, just looks yeah. translucent, like it's backlit or something. Yeah, well, probably is. Yeah. Hey, um, um, the one you've got your cursor on there, Luke uh, Grant. Have you had yeah. him on your show? We haven't actually, but would love. I'd love. Oh to yeah, have he's on the list. Him. I've not yeah. met him, but I've seen some of his black and white work, and it's outstanding. Yeah, oh, Grant's yeah. a real, real. Uh, oh, for a long time, yeah. Particularly waterfalls and, and right. water movement. Um, he's got some really great shots of Bombo Quarry as well that, that do well in competitions. Um, and I so yeah, it's not surprising to see. His, I think I don't think it's his first time he's been shortlisted either. Right. Um, right. Uh, um, love the um, the possum backlit. Yes, isn't that wild. clever? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. it's, a, it's a great urban conversation, isn't it? The way wild creatures sort of interact with our everyday sort of world, and it's a very really clever way to, to do it. I think also if he didn't, if it wasn't made black and white or mono, that you know the colours of the clothing would probably be quite distracting as well. So mm. probably a good choice to go mono there. And it, it must have been well anticipated to be able to no, find it an alignment in it. Sensor. Oh, it's a f- oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. So he didn't right. have to anticipate at all. <laughs> Which is oh, good. oh come on! on the clothes, a motion sensor on their clothesline. Yeah, well, obviously this has been something that's been or happening. Or I'd say the AR uh, would be infrared um, motion sensor. But, that, but, you, know, you know what? But but Nick's bring Nick's brought up a really good point. The best photographers for these sorts of things are the ones who actually know animal behavior really well. Yeah, and so therefore they anticipate the movement, the patterns of the animals to be able to then. Uh, capture these images because some obviously you know just happen on the fly but others are very well planned mm. and and come about because the photographer knows the subject so well mm. yeah yeah that's right you need to know something's going on to want to put that trap there to start I think with. They, just briefly the, the aesthetics of these first two are really quite astonishing i think in both of them um, you know two, that yeah. title of dna you know, helix the the delicacy of, love that. of the um all the different structures and those flowers are just mm. absolutely exquisite. Gorgeous. Yep. Yeah, it's really great. Great. The fungi one. The first great one. title, DNA Helix. Title, yeah. yeah, it really is. That, that, that one's my favourite, I think. 
Yeah, yeah, I, like yeah. I think overall it's probably my favorite. A lot of great detail in this one. Incredibly well. artistic. It doesn't look like it's strictly yeah. black and white either. It actually looks like it's got a blue tone to the. You know, yeah, it's like just the slight, yeah, it's slight bluish to it, which yeah, I like. I agree. It just I like looks that. like an artistic creation. Like they're just mm. almost like feather light, just layering on top of each other. You know, just delicately, and you can yeah. blow them away with a breath. It's... So the the rules for the category is it must be chosen. Uh, the subject must be chosen that will qualify for any of the first five categories. <laughs> So that's all the landscape and, and animal habitat and all that. Uh, this category includes all monochrome photography, including black and white, sepia-toned and infrared photographs. Right. Yeah. Yep. So you can have some coloration to the image, so to speak. Yep. yep. And the yep. winners awesome. are... So the winners. And the winners are... Uh, when it decides to load. And, oh, there we go. <laughs> oh, there you go. There you go, uh, yeah. We'll just run her up. I think yeah. Jeff, well Jeff done, won. Yeah. Well done, Jeff, Jeff. On, the, on the win there in the monochrome. And um, yeah, the beautiful right. um, cockatoo. Wonderfully graphic. Yeah. yeah, yeah, so the, graphic. The man, the man with the biceps. Yeah. Like, <laughs> go. Let's do it. Still, we're we're yeah. starting a room in here, Paul. We don't know that for sure, but yes, he has handheld an 800 mil lens. <laughs> I'm going to be jumping on Facebook now and seeing if I can find that bloke. <laughs> See if he's got guns like we're talking about. <laughs> That oh, looks yeah. quite an intimidating photograph to take with a handheld flash. <laughs> right, our impact. Now, I might read out the yeah, read category uh, thing for this. So the image must depict human impact on nature, be it terrestrial, marine, or atmospheric. This impact may be negative or positive. The choice of subject is broad, including any subject that will qualify for categories one to five or may extend beyond the these to subjects relating to pollution and climate change. So, yeah, it's a really broad um, interpretation category, this one. Um, and I know myself, I, I um, uh, entered, I remember one of the shots I entered into this just to, as a bit of a distraction was a, um, was a shot of a, a layered um, a bank where the bank had fallen away uh, there was a layer of Aboriginal midden through the dirt, just a, like a strata strata layer, and then there was a um, a fence, um, a, a star picket that went straight through that strata into the um, uh, in, uh, through the erosion into the dirt. And it was, um, so that was my uh, one showing the impact of land um, land use and management, and also the Aboriginal. Um, uh, use of the land in the same shot and it got nowhere absolutely nowhere the judges <laughs> obviously didn't like it but just showing that's a sort of interpretation that you can put yeah. on these things the amazing amount of detail on that with the yeah. i guess the the flash has been able to bring that out that's, that's, a, a, that's a stunning lots of magenta for you tom what's that sorry lots of magenta for you on that one no oh, we, we we don't mind that i think the um i think the costco yeah. shot is very interesting. That really captured my eye. Pretty striking. Pretty confronting. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I mean, as a brand, you know, it just speaks volumes about our culture. Very much. Well, just and just, they're full of face masks as well. Oh yeah. right. Ended up washing up face masks all over the beach as well. So it's, it's a very topical. Yeah. Topical yeah. part of the storytelling. But what a, what a clever way to to represent this. We're clever way to shoot this, isn't it? Right. Yeah. From, from yeah, there in the, from the top down, yeah, yeah, and this the timing of, of that division of the wave, you know, they, they would have been quite deliberate about that. This um, happens more often than we think. Uh, I had a client years ago who um, immigrated from the US to Australia and lost um, most of their furniture overboard on the ship that oh, was no. traveling from the USA to Australia in a violent storm that just tipped overboard, ended up at the bottom of the sea. That's not very handy. No, this is um, no. dead center, too, isn't it? Um, like totally right down the middle, hmm. yeah. And the and the penguin strapped to the this one here. What's the story the, here? The, the, a fairy yeah. tunchy, yeah. Right. More of a scientific um, in, uh, thing going on. What's it? What are they doing? Yeah, but they tell a lot of stories when they share for X-ray like yeah. that, don't they? Hmm. Okay, yeah. so it's for well, um, I love the, the rarest um, bird in New Zealand. Thirty-six adults left in existence. Oh wow, oh, like crikey. So that'd be why they're trying to work out what happened. We have an Australian fairy turn, but it's I'm not sure how it's related to the New Zealand one. Uh, but it's not it's in it's not common. It's, well, that's been one of the rarest creatures of the world we're looking at. 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 36. There's ah. not that's, that's very few birds in existence, God mm. forbid. Mm. Yeah, up there with the orange bellied parrot. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Um, I love the uh, the one with the ruler up the the, the top right. They, um, yeah, they're smuggling live live and DVD players. Yeah. And yeah. They got busted. What, yeah, what I love about this shot is the 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 surroundings of it all. Um, yeah. Showing, Showing how it's um, all been taken apart, but it, from my point of view, it's it's very forensic you know, because yeah. we use the exact same rulers for for this sort of scale shot, and um, and I love the gloves also included in there. It's it's you know it's a sort of um, um, it's it's like a, a technical sort of oh, I don't know the best way to describe, but it's very forensic sort of shot, which is great. Yeah. Uh, but but has that artistic graphic element that um, that makes it um, really special. So mm. it's a beautiful shot. Any other but, thoughts on like on what, are the, what are the rules about being on top of whales just with drones and stuff? If I might, ah, uh, well, it doesn't start. save. Uh, this is from a drone. Um, where is it? Yeah, um, Devo Magic Maverick New too. Zealand. Um, it depends on what the rules are in New Zealand, I guess. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. And, um, I, and I wouldn't wouldn't say it's a very well accepted kind of uh, thing to do. Uh, fly over whales. I think it's acceptable so long as the whale has come to the drone as opposed to the drone. Oh, uh, yeah. Wow. I'm joking. Not, I'm joking. Not chasing it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can clearly move the, the drone, drone away from the whale if the yeah. whale comes past. Yeah, I, I, that's probably my pick, the top right. I think the, the aesthetic of, of, of modern life, the conversation about, about smuggling, the, the fact that it's still alive, the geometric kind of framing, the, the um, complexity and, 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 um, positioning of everything and, and the color sort of popping around in different areas as well as a, a bit of negative space it's, it's you've got a lot of room to breathe and a lot of a lot to reflect on with this image i think it's, it's very strong mm. well there you go we'll see what the winners were mm. oh there you go oh there you go i actually got one <laughs> that was the winner there you yes. go so um, sorry, definitely um oh. in agreement there and then this one was the runner-up yep um, um by Justin Gilligan, who's obviously he took. Oh out, yes, he, he won, out the, he whole won thing. Um, the year. I think bag of face masks. Yeah, uh, with yeah. his um, spider crab shot. Yeah, yeah, very, very, very topical shot. Yep, and yeah. um, what was I going to say? It the, creates uh, a jellyfish-like shape with the reflection yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah. 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 I was so clever about it. Good point. Yeah, it was probably the same container ships that um were in the other shot. Um. Right, maybe. <laughs> yeah, Ended more lost. Yeah, um, more lost containers. Well, wow. yeah. interestingly, um, I heard today on the news that Lord Howe Island hasn't had any single case of COVID at all, and they're ninety-five percent vaccinated. So, yeah. wow, that'd be, that'd be exciting to get a container load of masks um, washing up on the shore. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd say, um, that, that, I mean, it's it's pretty good that they're up there because, you know, from a hospitalisation perspective and care, you know, that, that would be a very challenging place to live. Well, so, you know what? As um, as it's been proven, the if you're on, a, on an island, you're actually doing quite well during COVID. Oh, yes. The smaller yes. the island, the better. Yeah. As, that, as you that, Tasmanians are finding out. That is, um, that is something that... that you're um, slightly has, smaller has than been, us, um, uh, has been us noticed. mainlanders. <laughs> Oh, yeah, here's the Botarong uh, one I was telling yeah, you about. So we'll just go through. Um, do you want to read out threatened species, Nick, while I just oh, go through I can these? do that. Threatened species. The subject may be photographed in any of the following ways. In portrait, engaged in natural activity, or in its natural habitat. Uh, so that, that's probably where that, that rule um, thing is, um, Paul. Where it can be in captivity. It says engaged in natural activity or in its natural habitat. All entries selected in this category, flora um, or fauna, must be listed as vulnerable, endangered, or critically endangered on the IUCN red list. So I think um, our pencil pines are. Yeah, I've entered some pencil pine yeah, shots on there. this before. Yeah. Um, didn't get any gongs, but um, yeah, it's, it's definitely um, some. Look, of I'm going to I'm going to go with uh, yeah. my um, the last the one of the turtle further down. Yeah, I, I just uh, you know it, it's nice in the description. You can kind of hear about how he's deliberately rotated the camera and swung it to mm. to give us this. Um, unusual sort whirlpool. of impression yeah. and, and whirlpool. And he, if, you, if you bring up the description, it speaks to as to why he's chosen to use that technique. 
um, you know, they're endangered and he wanted to almost like make them look ghostly to, to speak to that recognition of just how they may be ghosts soon. And I, and I think it kind of speaks to that really beautifully. It's also, if you've, uh, if you watch those finding finding Nemo movies, you'll you'll you'll, you'll see the analogy of this uh, speed going down the plug hole. They find in the ocean, <laughs> the turtles like a race down as well. <laughs> so that works for me as well. But um, yeah. yeah, I just appreciate the that uh, you know taking the time in an unusual situation to use a a risky technique to pull off a shot. Mm. I, I just applaud applaud the photographer for that as well. Yeah, nice um, wide fish eye there, eight to fifteen as well. We get very wide. I just about have to have that. Uh, that on the nose of the lens too. Yeah, very right. close. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Yep. Any other thoughts on? Oh, I love that bilby down there on the bottom yeah. right. Yeah, that's a hard one to get, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, poor little buggers. They get, you know, smashed by foxes and stuff like that. Pin sharp too. Yeah, feral cats as well. I feral, bet. Oh, feral cats are probably the biggest threat, I'm sure. But um, yeah, just beautiful little animal. It's been, yeah, really well captured. The um the flying fox uh, I think um offer one a few years ago with um, yeah. similar shots. Mm. Yeah, amazing. Oh, that is very. That's an awesome shot though. Beautifully right? timed. Part of me wants to darken it down a little bit, just to give it a little bit more atmosphere. But at the same time, it's um yeah, you, and give it a bit of more of a spookier sort of atmosphere. And you'd be allowed to do that in, in the rules. I love the um the turn fairy oh, turn. It's got its head turned as well up on the yeah. And, uh, you know, Matt's. Oh uh, yeah, and that's quite unusual. I mean, the yeah. way that alliteration and it almost gives like a sound to the photograph yeah. um, by introducing the, those little dotted sort of swirls and the way the peak is positioned exactly along the line of mm. of the wingspan from mm. left to right, and it separates the color a little bit more as well and. Um, so it's going to make the, you wonder about the behaviour, you know, what it's actually doing. Well, what these birds do, I suspect what's happened here, I'm, I haven't read the description, but um, terns in particular are a bit like gannets. They dive into the water to catch their fish and they'll, or, or they'll dip into the water to catch them and then it, it's shaking its head to just get rid of any excess water. Water, so, yeah, because it was the weight flying. I also wanted to applaud Matt's photograph, actually, of the, um, the oh. lighting and the timing and the positioning, the anticipation he's got of, his, of, his, of the quail shot. Yeah. If you want to get that, uh, that get up, I, I think it has a, a beautiful poise about it, and it's a very graceful sort of moment. And and um, you know to get the timing and positioning right to have a side light coming through a gap in a log like that, and know that it's going to be there, and 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 be comfortable enough with with having you there as well at the same time. There's off, off camera flash as well there, Paul. Yeah, yeah, yeah very clever. And uh, beautifully framed as well. That lovely mm. depth you can follow, sort of all Great the way pose through as well, like the inquisitive. Nice posing. Excellent training of, of the subject. Mm. <laughs> and they move pretty quick, so it's in, in a low. And Matt, Matt's done a beautiful job, give, giving a lot of his personal time to documenting the animals at Bonnerong. Hats off to Matt for that. Yeah, and there's um penguins down the bottom here. They're pretty cool. Yeah, that's a that's got a beautiful you? aesthetics to it. The repetition of all those birds, um, as well as the mm. waves. It's just got. It's a busy image, but by mm. the same token, it's um it's got some lovely aesthetics. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right, we'll see um the what, winner is what happened with the winners, and we've got um the devil oh. in this one. So what's going on here? This is the Mariah Mariah Island. Island, Tassie Devil. Mariah Island, yeah. Well, we, we saw one on Mariah, didn't we, Paul? When when they were um trapping them to to monitor the population. Yeah, we got um, lucky and. Yeah. witness to a release how are they going down there what's the general consensus well they they're going like, oh. but they're having quite a lot of impact on everything else in particular the um, cape barren geese there were 140 pairs and last time we were there they, they were down to 39 yeah and it was largely because the devils were, were chewing chewing them all up yeah right. and they had to start um uh, roosting up in the trees i think just to stop getting eaten um yeah. so yeah so this what yeah what we mean tom is the the devils were introduced specifically to Mariah Island to protect them from um, the the uh, facial, facial tumor, tumor disease. Yep. Um, yep. So yeah, we're talking about their their impact on on the rest of the because there, there were never any devils on Mariah Island, right? Um, so we've introduced uh, an I apex. Cape Barren geese either, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so, Cape, so, the Cape Barren geese is an interesting story, just because because when I started bird watching thirty odd years ago, Cape Barren geese were actually endangered. They've um, had a brilliant comeback because mm. they got hunted almost to extinction by 
the white settlers who came in and decided that they were pretty good eating for one mm. reason or another. I'm not sure whether they are or not, but they were they were very rare to, to see. And uh, I've even seen them in the paddocks around home here, which has oh, been wow. awesome to point Jeez, out. And yeah. I think Ollie just thinks I'm absolutely ridiculous when I tell the whole story about them. But um, <laughs> yeah, they're, they're far more common than they used to be, which is mm, a awesome. fantastic story. Mm. And it's fa- it's very rare to get a, a capture like this because you, you don't see them in daylight very often at all. And to get the anticipation of the moment and get, you know, have the right lens and we'll be able to get close enough to catch them in light as well. And I like the way the exposure is really handled. I love the the green and yellow kind of kind of separation, the framing around from left to right. Uh, and just that little touch of the depth of field really works for me as well. It'd be really pretty distracting without that kind of mm. softness in the background and pull you away from it. So, so 14 days in Mariah is not a bad effort. I'm, I if he was trying to be a devil yeah, all the time, I he's definitely spent come away with over the years, but not in a row. Like yeah, that. that's that's impressive. But I, I mean, I'd totally do it if I had the time. It's an amazing place. So, so, yeah, well, that's, so that was the, the runner up. That's the ugliest devil I've ever seen, though. Great yeah, job yeah, of it, but it's an ugly, bit of age on ugly bastard. Yeah, it's pretty mangy. Uh, the, um, and what are they are? They're going to shoot up Scott, congratulations, Scott. All right, well done mm-hmm. again, Mr. Portelli. Oh, gee whiz. It's just, this wins um, everything, doesn't it? <laughs> good day on YouTube. So, um, yeah, thanks for joining us on YouTube, Scott. Um, oh, yeah, and thanks for um, loaning us your your, uh, your images for the um, for our cover shot, Scott. Yeah, we'll get that. to that. Um, so we'll just, I think we're, we've only got a couple more left. So we're actually going pretty well with time, guys. We'll, well we've got an hour right. left, so we're, uh, yeah. <laughs> we're going very well. Um, so we'll just go over to the portfolio. Minutes. We've um, <laughs> been worded up by Mr. Tim Wright to, to go easy. So um, Yeah, so he did um, say that to you I, too. Yeah. He was concerned. He was concerned about it. I mean, concerned. I'm not sure I think why. Lighting, what was he concerned about? Do you want to um, read out about the portfolio, Nick, while we just go through it? Uh, okay, so it's not quite a category in itself. Um, and it doesn't say here, um, but basically, um, you can if you enter, you can enter as many photos as you like in the competition, but only four per category. Um, and you can uh, enter if you've entered six or more images in the entire competition, then you can uh, be eligible for the portfolio prize. And that's exactly what's happened with. Um, with Tim here, all, all aerial images, some of them no doubt in the landscape category, probably four, I'd say, and, and two maybe animal habitat. I think the, the one with the... The, the, oh, left. the, the, the one in the top right um, has got animals. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yep. Oh, as you can see. Animal habitat. There you go. Yeah. Animal habitat. Um, I don't know what the... I say he's cheated. Buffalo his tracks. Yeah. And our impact. So it's yeah, landscape, our impact. impact, and animal habitat. There's a landscape. There's a landscape. Mm. There's a our impact Act. there, which is um you know, it's yeah, yeah, the huge of dieback of the mangroves out there. I was talking yeah. about very um about. very um cleverly sort of chosen categories and and you know obviously highly mm. relevant as well. Um, That's probably my favourite. That one there. Yeah, it's, same with me. Yeah, it's just yeah, a magnificent photograph, beautiful, beautiful graphic yeah, colours. And, of course, the, you know, the, the thing to remember with these um, photographs is that you can't manipulate the colours beyond, uh, you know, a, a bit of uh, contrast and saturation. saturation. Still needs but to be are... true to the natural scene. Oh, I was yeah. sitting over that about six yeah. weeks ago, boys. I think this is probably my favourite, this one. Um, yeah, it's brilliant. That's, yeah. that's exactly where I got to when our pilot got the message from the military that we had to get this right? Right, right. right away. Oh my God. I got like three photos off after flying for 45 yeah. minutes to get there and spending a thousand bucks. Yeah, the full I got, story I got is three in your, um, episode. No, it the, no, it's your um, the, the road trip episode. So oh. so. Mm. Uh, top um, left is the same area, actually. Mm. Yeah, Bonner Harbour. Beautiful. The, the, the other really interesting shot is the, is the, the top right one. Yeah, this is one of my favorites, there. actually. That one there. Yeah, just because if you read it, so. Um, uh, yeah, the water buffalo movements. Bud Plain is punctuated by water buffalo tracks. And if you look closer, you may find water buffaloes basking uh, in water mud buffalo. wallows. So there's actually water buffaloes Let's see, uh, maybe zoomed in there. Oh, oh, yeah. right. Well, yeah. he's got well, a hundred megapixel camera, so that would help. Bastard. Yeah. Well, you, you <laughs> want to see this is a, a two meter print, I think. Um, I'll loan it to us, Tim. Unreal. Yeah. But uh, yeah, uh, yeah just, just love it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, okay, well, congratulations, Tim. Tim's Tim, on our um, so. on YouTube. So um, yeah, thanks for joining us, Tim. And 
hopefully we've um, done your images. So how would you us. how would you go about it? Like if you, if you you can't really set a target to win portfolio then because you can't submit a portfolio. I think you can still go for it if you can put a cohesive, like what Tim's done, he's got a cohesive body of work, but he's entered it across categories and it's pretty, I think, you know, it's no surprise that he would have been a high contender for a portfolio because yeah, I guess of that. that's a bit of a gamble though, because so, they're all in different categories and they may not make it to the yeah. short list. Or I don't, I don't well, know I mean, it, I think some of these are very strong, even from a landscape category uh, perspective. So um, I'm just talking you know, purely about how to, how to target trying to get the portfolio price. Uh, I think well, it's a few Go you back, you go enter back the six and in there, and um, uh, if there's six very strong images, um, then then um, then that that'll get considered. So um, yeah. I think basically the organisers will get through any any entrants that have six or more uh, in the judging session, and actually bring all of those up and, and look through all of those. Um, as most competitions I know that have a portfolio prize, you you submit them as a portfolio not randomly in different categories that might get picked out collectively retrospectively that's that's what was turned my head in a little bit yeah and if you enter more than that i think they would pick the six strongest to actually or the, oh no i think it's just whatever you entered isn't it, it i mean these just sit together so six, well yeah. um, no, yeah. i'll pick the six best for the portfolio or not even six but you have to enter six or more yeah. uh, i know 2017 julie fletcher won the prize with only five images. Um, and Across how many categories again, Nick? Is it two or three? At least three categories, is it? You have to... Um, I don't know if it matters in that number no, of categories. Yeah. Just, you can only enter four. Least two. Oh, right. Yeah. So you're going to have to go across um, at least two. Categories. Categories. Yeah. four maximum yeah. per category, isn't it? Four yeah. per category. So, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah it's, basically, it's basically a prize. It's it's prize that, that isn't awarded as a as a cohesive sort of um, entry over the six shots. It's it's basically you've entered six shots that are absolutely wonderful yes. in different categories. And as a result, you know, they're the best six. But uh, if you're gonna look if you're gonna look at all, all the six images on a screen and they did have something in common or they were stronger together, then then the judges were more likely going to go for for that. So um, I still feel like um, th that, you know, even though that's not part of the criteria, I think it still would um, have some sway in terms of the oh. judging process. So just, for, just for the viewers, Tim is actually, we actually had a show on Tim's trip to get these exact images. So if you want to know more about it, you, you've got two hours to, to enjoy of exactly the backstory. And I, again, I really have to applaud Tim for, I think, for, Four of these images in particular were taken from an area that very few people have flown to, and he spent a lot of money and did a lot of research to, to get out to mm. uh, to the bite um, on the eastern sort of um, edge of or the western edge of the Gulf Carpenteria. Uh, so hats off to you, Tim. Uh, I'm glad it paid off for you, mate. Mm, absolutely, it did. And to get um, six in there like that, yeah, it's an unbelievable yeah. result. So yeah, I've um, just scrolled through back um, quite a few years on the portfolio prize and. Tim's entry this year is definitely the most cohesive as a, a portfolio together. Yeah. Um, uh, all the others are, are, are you know, they have, some of them have very similar sort of shots, like all bird shots or all underwater shots and that sort of thing. But um, this is, Tim's is certainly the most cohesive um, that stands out oh, really? as being cohesive. And, and it's going to go into an exhibition. So it's got to, Look like good on a wall as well, basically. So it's got to no work problems there, yeah, especially yeah. shot at 100 megapixels. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, aerial jealousy. Lot of aerial jealousy is ugly emotion, isn't it? Hopefully, they come <laughs> to the um, the um, Australian Museum so Tim gets to see them there. That'd be amazing. Mm. So, um, he would like. He, I'm sure he'd like me to also point out the fact that these are the first lot of aerial shots that have won the portfolio prize in this competition as well. All oh, right, yeah. there you go. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Well done. All right. Overall winner. Yeah, overall winner. That's the only thing we've got left. So I um, wonder, what, wonder who that is. No, it's, um, of course, it's Scott Patelli. Um, Scott well done, Scott. Scott. Oh, what an um, amazing photo. An, an incredible job here and um, just magnificent. Yeah. The, the way that, obviously, the glowing eyes is just the um, the star of it, really. Yeah, exactly. The The... Beautiful underexposure of that photograph, in inverted commas. There you go. He's even said underexposed to highlight the details and the appendages and the, and the eyes themselves. Just glorious. Wow. Mm. Such just, a yeah. beautiful picture. Yeah, Striking animal portrait of a very, you know, elusive sort of creature. 
And uh, yeah, the, the eyes are almost like the eyes of Sauron or something like yeah. that. Yeah, of the Rings. Yeah, very much. They're very, They're very, very, um, yeah. very, yeah. I just want to take my hat off to Scott for the fact that he's a, obviously a brilliant underwater photographer, but he's getting in the water at night time. That would scare the shit out of me. There's yeah. no way I'd do that. I'd be afraid of something swimming up behind me and grabbing me. <laughs> no way. Wowzers. That's, yeah. that, hats off. Yeah. So Scott, as a winner, won $10,000 cash and a holiday prize generously provided by Coral Expeditions that no doubt he can't take at the moment. Mm. <laughs> But um, if you need a loan, um, Scott Samir. <laughs> no, he's probably already spent that money already on some new equipment. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that'd be half a lens or half a underwater housing or something. <laughs> you know, definitely from that. You know, us photographers, we're always got our eye on the next piece of equipment that we need to acquire. Yeah, or or maybe four of Paul's car. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not get into personal stuff. Hey? Oh, he's gone. Where's Paul gone? Uh, he's not even there to um to take the. Oh, is he gone? Oh, he's gone. Yeah. Oh, gee, I have to say it again when he comes back. <laughs> Just get oh. in to watch the last few minutes of the replay, mate, Nick. Yeah. No. Well, um, I mean, that's the end of the that's the end of the competition. So, um, what did you guys all think overall um from the competition and and sort of any sort of closing thoughts or um, um messages to the audience. Oh just gets the, the standard just gets higher and higher every year um it's um you know if you go back and have a look through the um the the, the winners etc over the years which you can do on the south australia museum website um you'll see that the the photography's changed a bit um and uh, the standard has always been extremely high but it's um it, it appears to be going up every year and, and certainly there are they're attracting more entries every year, so it's harder to get into a short list. But um, if you have a, a bit of a, a look through, you'll see what, what you need to be doing to, to get something in the short list. Um, and, um, yeah, good luck. I definitely recommend everyone um, have a go. Mm. It's a really good competition. Um, and the, what, what is great about it is that you don't have to win to actually get your images up on a wall, which I always thought that felt was really awesome. And, and yep. in some ways just being shortlisted which is also the same as being a finalist um is, is a massive achievement in its own right um, yep. and you get rewarded for that unfortunately you don't get rewarded financially um but um like being able to go into a gallery and see your image up on the wall against all, all of these other amazing images and you're walking into you know these big museums um you know with the you know the all of the dinosaur bones and everything as you walk past and come in like it's kind of cool to to be there so um you know i don't really know many other competitions like it where you can have that kind of experience so definitely um definitely a highlight of my photographic career getting in there and hopefully we'll get in there another day i mean when you see the um landscape particularly um which is a category i normally go after when I mean, you see the quality of the results in there you, you you start you can understand why you don't you don't get shortlisted from time to time so um yeah, yeah. and and absolutely. also look look if you if you want to be a bit more strategic about it have a look and see who the um the judges are for the year um they usually announce before the competition closes. Yeah. Um, so you can get a, if you get a feel for the sort of thing that they produce and they enjoy doing, you might get a bit of a hint as to um, the sort of images that they may enjoy. Um, I know that's a sort of a, a general thing that, um, that, that that's advice that's given for photographic competitions because it is very subjective. Photography is very subjective, as we know, uh, but it might help you improve your chances if you tailor it towards the judges mm. uh, but um, but generally high quality images technically great and high impact because uh, maybe you can just talk about the the impact that you need Luke when you you know as a judge you're going through 2,000 images how important is that oh I mean it yeah it's a it's a, I mean it's a wow factor I guess it, I hate to say it like that but um you know it has to have either something that's interesting and different and curious and, and makes you want to know more mm -hmm. uh, or it's something that's very familiar but done in a very different way I mean if it's a if it's something that's very common and you've shot it in a very common way or and, you know it's no different to other shots you've seen then the likelihood that that's going to do well is, is quite diminished. So it's really about being creative. And you can see that in a lot of aspects here, creativity has been rewarded. Um, and also um, maybe thinking outside the box, which is, I guess, creativity, but also, um, yeah, just um, 
focusing on and trying trying to create your own images i think is is the real key thing not not um doing things that you've seen before and i guess um if you uh were to look at the images maybe as thumbnails or, or something like that you know what's what's the construction of the image overall that would make a judge want to stop and look at it and there was a few that were really really busy and that actually quite surprised me that and maybe they were so busy that the the judges wanted to stop and really take a bit of time to to look through that to see what the actual detail was that was in the image so um you yeah, see so. like if you look at these images here there's a lot of subject separation mm. so that's a key feature in, in terms of really clarifying what your subject is which i think in, in a very scientific based competition like this is is quite crucial mm. You don't want people being confused about what what you're speaking to and what the conversation is, is sort of meant to be about. That's a really good point, Paul. Yeah, look at that as you scroll through this. It's very clear what the subject is and very, you know, quite central generally and very um, yeah obvious that you, you've got a pretty good idea. But then you get images like this where you're just kind of very intrigued and want to know more as well. So. Mm. Uh, it does go both ways. Um, yeah, it's yeah. nice that there's room for the abstract as well, which I really appreciate. It, it, there's a lot of creative use of lighting, and you'll notice that a lot of a lot of the subjects have been painted with with light in different sort of ways and forms. So, it could be a bit of inspiration to go out and start experimenting with that. Off camera flash really opens up a whole other world, particularly with things like macro. Mm. And um, Tom, did you want to talk about the about? For a competition like this, about your knowledge of the subject and how that will. Yeah, that was my help. next point. Yeah. Well, I think at the end of the day, the best photographers are the ones who know their subjects the best um, mm -hmm. because they can just predict behaviour, as I said before, and and know what a perhaps a unique situation is in order to be able to capture something that is going to stand out and impress the judges. So. I think play to your strengths. I think at the end of the day, I, I wouldn't look at this and, you know, you can certainly be inspired and say, I'm going to go out and shoot some bird photography because I love what I've seen here in this competition. But um, I, I would always say that you don't go out and shoot images to necessarily win competitions because that can just oh. be a dangerous precedence in which mm -hmm. to yeah, try and win. Up. You know, you sort of stick to your lane, you know, stick to your lane, shoot, stick with what you're good at, what, what you're passionate about shooting, and then if it happens to be good enough to do well in a competition like this, well, that's, um, you know, all well and good. That's that's my sort of final take on it. Mm, I think that's very true. And you can even see that in Tim's um, portfolio winners. He's very much stuck to what he what he does best and, and he's found the categories that match what he does. And um, yes, rather that's than right. having to reinvent the wheel for rather his own the other personal way shooting. Yeah. Um, so I think um, you don't. Don't don't chase the categories, and you know maybe work out what you've shot that would fit in a category. I think more so um, um, helps would be a better approach because I'd, you want to. I'd say also do yourself a favor and take the time to look through the images and read the captions and look at the technical information because by understanding the kind of focal lengths that are being used, the kind of lighting that's being used, the kind of subject matter information, you, there's actually quite a lot to learn um, within that context, and it's unusual to have access to that kind of information from photographs that have been taking in competitions. So it's, it's quite a, it's quite a unique uh, library of, of material uh, to, to draw upon and learn from. I, and I also, um, I, sorry, Tom, you go. I wouldn't also discount um, if you're starting out in photography or in a, in a category that you're wanting to pursue to reach out to some of these photographers, you know, hit them up on the socials, et cetera. And, and, tap into their knowledge and say, hey, you know, what advice would you give for somebody like myself who's starting out in photography? I want to be an underwater photographer just like you, Scott, and I love your work, et cetera, et cetera. You just don't know what sort of relationship or bond that you could form with those photographers who could then become almost like a mentor. And I'm not saying that any of them would in particular, but you never know who might be giving enough to be able to give their information and help you and guide you just occasionally to, you know, oh, do you mind if I throw you half a dozen pictures that I've taken recently? Could you give me some feedback on them? You know what I mean? Things like that. I, I, I think that's a valuable resource to tap into. And I don't think anyone should shy away from reaching out to these um, brilliant photographers in their game if you're looking for a little bit of advice in order to help you along the way. And there are organisations and groups around Australia that, that specify in bird photography and different things like that, or uh, that Tom would probably know. Um, there's certain sort of, uh, and, and a lot of camera clubs, there's a lot of specialist knowledge and there's different members that are, that are really sort of fine-tuned in terms of pursuing different kinds of photography, whether it's macro, whether it's using lighting, whether it's close-up, whether it's insects. So, you know, by joining a club and fishing around and seeing who's out there, 
And there's also just going on a workshop, going on a workshop with Scott Patelli and learn how to do mm, it. Absolutely. One of the best. absolutely. Um, you know, you can't go wrong doing that. And, and you'll leapfrog yourself, you know, massively by doing that as well. Mm-hmm. There you go. The checks in the mail, Scott. <laughs> so we're going so to actually keep- mention that um, the, the um, prize money probably went to paying bills from not working for a year. So uh, <laughs> probably there. Um, yeah. So look, um, I think we'll probably have to wrap it up there right on time. Um, one thing I did want to say is if you do have a chance um, to see the exhibitions, um, I'm not sure where they're actually at under the COVID scenario, but if you have a chance to actually go and see these in print as well and um, really pour over the images and see them in a bit more detail. Sometimes seeing them on a screen in front of you um, doesn't doesn't actually, you don't understand why the, the image was seen a certain way and then you see it in print and then it all of a sudden makes sense. So it's a really good idea to get along and, and check those out and they're, pre- they're presented very, very nicely. Um, so, so it's well worth doing. Look, I'll just also- put a quick shout out before we finish. Um- I actually specialize and work with a lot of photographers around the world uh, in terms of preparing images for competitions and books and exhibitions and things like that. So people want a, a bit of more one-on-one time. I imagine Tom maybe is open to something like that as well, particularly during lockdown. Yep. Uh, but there's people you can reach out to, you know, that actually specialize in, in helping people prepare images and doing image critiques and, and helping curate bodies of work and select images for competitions and, and, you know, learn from the craft and what you've done before to, to leapfrog forward. So don't be afraid to um, probably have a good time, particularly in lockdown, to invest in that kind of thing and mm. go back through your image libraries and, and do some research on the different competitions that are out there or start putting, you know, putting that book, book project, you know, to life or, or reaching out and getting the, the feeling for an exhibition for when things open up. It's, it's probably no better time in some ways. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I echo that. Um, Paul's um, very diligent in, in providing feedback and, and um, uh, helping you become a better photographer. So definitely hit Paul up if you're keen on getting some image critiquing uh, done of your, of your own work. And, um, Give me a special yeah. rate, Tom. <laughs> Thanks, mate. Thanks, mate. Um, I'll, and I'll offer the same to you. And thank you so, so much for joining us again, Tom. Um, it's always a pleasure to have you on. And um, we really appreciated your insights, especially into the bird world and, and the, the wildlife uh, side of things as well. So, um, yeah, we're really grateful that you could join us tonight. I noticed that I was about. Yeah, thanks, Hank, Tom. I, I noticed that I was third wheel or so, but I'm happy. Uh, <laughs> thanks for um, the special attention, your, your, <laughs> the, 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 special the attention to your hair tonight. I've Thank you. Well, I was going to mention that. I just realised that my hair is not looking great at all, but it has had a beautiful cut. Oh, look at Mary, that. Wow. That you it may have seen on freshly Facebook or last or something. Night. If you have not seen that already, jump onto my Facebook and you'll be able to see the half hour of cut, the, the dog clippers that, that got, got the attention on the, oh, last um, night. So. Thanks, everyone, for the birthday wishes as well. And uh, happy um, birthday, if you mate. haven't awesome. liked the video or subscribed, um, feel free to. It certainly helps um, um, the word to get out there on our YouTube as well. So Yeah, thanks, Scott, um, again for lending us his images and yeah. also congratulations again. Mr. Yeah, Paul absolutely. Well, well done. done, Scott. It's an amazing achievement to, to win overall. Um, and with that, um, we'll um, sign off. Um, and um, would you want to talk about next week, Paul? Oh, yeah, a little bit excited, I have to say. One of my uh, most favourite photographers in the world we're having on, Mr Tony Hewitt, one of the potentially maybe the only triple grandmaster in the world of photography in both America, New Zealand and Australia. And, you know, we've taken a little while to, to get Tony on board, but he's, he's a very busy man and, and he's one of the most sought-after presenters um, in this part of the world. So it's a real privilege to, to have him on and he's going to be talking a lot about the curation and, and creating personal style, you know, how you develop and evolve as an image maker and, and use his pathway in a very transparent and, and open sort of way in terms of, you know, the way he's, he's moved forward through his very long and very successful career from different paths, you know. He's actually shot almost a 1,000 weddings. Who would have known that if you didn't know mm. sort of the backstory of, of him? So he's one of the most well-rounded people in the industry i think on on so many levels and as a person that i particularly look up to myself so um, i'm very 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 excited to have him on the show it's going to be a world-class show so um, make sure you're up for that one not one to miss absolutely um all right um thanks all um thanks all and we'll see you again next week um same time uh, with tony hewitt so 